Hi there everyone, greetings from all of us here on Isla. Uh, my name is Raymond Tibbs and I am one of the distillery ambassadors, so I'm based here at Brucladi itself. Um, it's Friday afternoon, the sun is shining, the birds are singing um, and I've got a gorgeous dram of the Ternary project here with me to keep me company. I'm actually sitting up at Warehouse 12 at the moment, so as you can see we've got stores of casks uh, just resting behind me here. And I really just wanted to take this opportunity uh, to thank you all for joining this event um, and assure you that you're going to have a fantastic time. Now, it's been very busy here on Isla at the moment. We've actually just reopened the Distillery Visitor Centre. So we've actually started welcoming guests back this week. And the production team have been very busy preparing for a gin distillation, but also distilling some local barley from one of the Isla farmers. So it's a fantastic opportunity uh, just to, to raise a glass and say cheers, enjoy your evening and hopefully it's not too long before we can welcome you all back to the island as well. So without further ado, Slanjava and have a great evening. Cheers. My mum used to say, did you go to school today? I said, yep. She said, come here. And she's smelling. I know, you've been in that damn distillery again. Bed, no dinner. Ancient, natural, old, pure. The blood of one small nation, absolutely. I would love to make whiskey at that distillery. The place was falling apart. There was a sign. It sort of encompasses the whole whiskey industry at the time. Exclamation. And I can remember thinking, I've got to do something about it. But we did it. We touched the void. Oh my God. How far can we go, you know? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Master and Jerome Whiskey Room on this Whiskey Wednesday night. Very special Whiskey Wednesday night. Uh, we're going to have uh, two incredible guests on the channel tonight talking all things Water of Life, uh, the new great uh, film, the new great documentary about all things Isla and the resurgence and the, the importance of, uh, and the lifeblood of, of Isla, which is uh, single malt scotch whiskey and everything else that goes hand in hand within, uh, with on, uh, on the island of Isla. Uh, one of my favorite lines from the movie uh, is, and this, this isn't just a scotch thing, this is probably for most whiskeys, for the people that craft it. When you buy a bottle of whiskey, you buy a hell of a lot more than liquor in a bottle. You're buying uh, tradition, you're buying craft, you're buying history, you're buying flavor, bringing culture to how you make it and appreciate it, the blood of a small nation. So uh, I think that's a great opening line for tonight uh, as we are going to welcome uh, Erica Beindorf and also the director of the wonderful film, uh, The Water of Life, Greg Schwartz. Uh, before we do that, I do want to say hi to a bunch of you in the chat for you guys hanging out tonight. Uh, Austin Feltz, Big Vic, Roy R. Does Things, Donald Rance, Whiskey Yoda's here. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Uh, we have Mike Meyer, uh, DC's in the house, man. Uh, Jim Morris is here. What's up, man? DMC Kentucky. Uh, let's see. Sunday evening scotch, of course. Uh, a lot of Brook Lottie fans, including me. Pop em, Don't Watch Him's in the house. Maureen Fr Fancy Franchi's here. Uh, Whiskey Central. Uh, I know Steve A is here. Donner Pass Whiskey. Terrence Scott. A bunch of you I know that have seen the movie already from previous, uh, from a couple of previous private events, but hoping to bring this out to a little bit of a bigger audience tonight for everybody to see. Uh, Black Bourbon Family is here. Raise your glass ups casually. Got to sing it a little bit for them. <laughs> uh, Taylor Ashley's in the house. Uh, let's see. First Phil Whiskey's here. Of course, the Bourbon Wrench. How you doing, Nighthawk? Uh, let's see. IC86. Uh, Brent Marquette. Aerial Astrion Services. 
So uh, tonight, guys, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, so you saw some clips of the, of the film Water of Life, which is, if you've, any of you guys have seen the movie Neat, which is a, a great film on bourbon, um, I got access to watch the Water of Life last night. I already watched it twice. <laughs> I took copious notes for tonight's live and um, absolutely loved it. It just, like, like, as soon as you watch it, you just want to book a ticket right away and go to Isla, like, immediately. Um, it kind of gives you that feeling, the feeling of, you know, we talk about the community of whiskey and, uh, and all that it entails. And I think you really get that feeling within, uh, within Isla and Scotch. I mean, the, the, um, the documentary does focus a little bit more on Brooke Lottie and Jim McEwen, who is just an absolutely legendary maverick of whiskey who helped to research, who, who helped the resurgence of Brooke Lottie and uh, brought them back to uh, prominence, uh, very large prominence. So we have Erica Beindorf on the channel as well, who's going to be, who's uh, the global ambassador for uh, Brook Lottie, who's going to be taking us through some of their core range offerings. And I think this one, this, this beautiful blue bottle, this classic Lottie and the Isle of Barley is actually a perfect single malt for bourbon drinkers as well. There's so much going on, but we'll talk about all that as well. Um, so let's... Uh, yeah, it makes you all warm and fuzzy inside, says Whiskey Central. Exactly. Uh, so let's welcome him in, guys. Let's talk to the director of The Water of Life. Let's bring in Mr. Greg Schwartz. How are you doing, Greg? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And the lovely Erica. How are you doing, Erica? Great. Glad to be back, you guys. All right. So like I said, we uh, now if you guys, anybody watching has questions for Greg, we'll go through that. Um, but first, first things first, we're going to dive into some whiskey uh, because that's what we're here for. Um, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, we hope so. Yeah, so <laughs> if none of you have seen the classic Lottie, it's, uh, it's this beautiful teal bottle, which was – now, forget me if I'm wrong. This, this was a Jim McEwen type of uh, choice, wasn't it? Was it not? Yeah, absolutely. It he was. decided – he picked this color. He picked this uh, – this, yeah, it was kind of a it was kind of a combo, and you know, Greg might even have more more info on this than I even do. We the the bottle itself kind of is a nod to you know Isla on a really pretty day when the you know sky is blue and the water's blue and it's that aqua marine color. Yeah, so for it was sure. kind of the the note behind that. Um, sure. It comes in this uh, beautiful can canister. We were I was kind of drumming on it earlier. I'm just saying, just you know, it's, <laughs> it's there if you need it. You know, the thing too about <laughs> drums, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, actually want to do a big shout out to Scotch for Dummies, uh, Scotch Test Dummies, um, Aqua Vitae, Scotch, on the, Scotch on the Bayou for uh, for mentioning tonight to all their uh, Scotch lovers. Uh, so hopefully we can get some more people to uh, to watch the film. Uh, Greg, when is the film officially releasing? Well, I mean, that's kind of a blurred line these days in that it is out. It's out now. I mean, it's just okay. out. What we're doing is we're doing online events. This is when, in a normal time, we would have been doing theaters and film and whiskey festivals. But yeah. when that ceased to be a reality, we started doing it uh, custom events, one-off Private, event. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then it'll be, you know, it'll be out in, like, more traditional streamers probably around Christmas time because we're going to keep doing these events because we're having – so much fun doing them because we get to do this, which is for whiskey nerds like us is actually a, we're we have three of these today, and our different people on our team are doing different ones. But you guys, yeah, you guys got the director. So I mean, we got <laughs> yeah, we, we got we got the director. We got we got the man that made the friggin' film. And I think do I do I hear your voice at the very very end of the film? Yeah, 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 yeah. Was that, that you? Was our, Good that pick. Was our I'm impressed. That yeah. Our editor did that kind of as a joke, and we all loved it. It was just you know. It was a really funny moment. I don't want to ruin it, but yeah, at the, at the very yeah. last scene of the film. Uh, Tom R says, I can't wait until Christmas to watch the movie. Well, if, you, you, don't stay, have to. if you stay tuned, you'll be able to watch it probably tomorrow if you want. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll have some information soon, guys, for you to get some access to the movie. Um, so so real quick, before we dive into Isle of Barley, uh, I'm sorry, the classic Lottie with, uh, with Erica. So one thing you guys may not know about this bottle is on the back – uh, right there. I don't know if I'll be able to pick it up with the camera. I was going to say, your camera's better than mine, Jason. Yeah. Oh, there's, oh, there's, between, our powers may be between the two of you. We've got yeah. it. <laughs> there's a slight, tiny little there we go. code there. There we go. Now we're really yeah. in it. <laughs> and that one that says 20 slash, uh, mine says 20 slash 182. Uh, 
One of the big reasons why Brook Lottie took off and was so popular was, and this is something we talk about in bourbon and American whiskey, is, uh, is transparency. Transparency is hugely important. And I don't know if there's many more distillery. I could think of Compass Box as a blender, maybe a couple of other handfuls that are, that are as transparent as Brook Lottie. Uh, but I'm going to show you guys this. If you go, I'm going to show you the, uh, if you go to, um, let's see, a Chrome tab. Uh, here it is. I don't know if you guys can see this. Can you guys see my screen right now? You got to take your overlay off because it's still split into the three of us. Oh, yeah. Let me uh, let me take that off real quick. Uh, there we go. There All it right. is. So you guys see my screen right here. So now... On the back of the on the back of the bottle, I'm gonna punch in that code, which is let's see here twenty. Damn, that's small writing. All right, twenty <laughs> minus it's twenty it's slash it's two three two. That's one eight two. Uh, then we're gonna click reveal, and then oh, and then, and then holy crap! Look at the <laughs> amount of whiskeys that are blended into this bottle. It's yeah. not just I mean, we're talking uh, a couple different ages. We're talking different casks. USA bourbon barrel fill. I know you guys use some good Jim Beam casks. Uh, we have uh, Spanish sher sherry butts, bourbon hogsheads, French oak, French sauternes, more bourbon, French pomerol, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc. Like, what the hell? <laughs> it's there's so much stuff going on in this bourbon. Let me uh, let me stop uh, doing that. All right, we're back to normal here. <laughs> So I mean, the the amount of transparency that that uh, Brook Lottie shows you guys is, you know, it's absolutely incredible. And when you taste this stuff, so now I just showed you all the crap that's in there, right? You would probably think this this whiskey is some crazy color. Look how light it is. I mean, it's so light. It's very straw like. I always say it's got that yeah. straw color. <clears throat> yet, yet it has such a deep, rich flavor profile. So. Erica, tell us a little bit more about Classic Lottie and kind of what, like, what kind of crazy alchemy goes into creating this? Yeah. So, I mean, Jim, like you kind of mentioned, is, is kind of the brainchild behind uh, Classic Lottie in general. Uh, we really love to just showcase um, everything we're making. We're not a distillery that has a ton of smoke and mirrors going on and all that. We really want to make sure, like, what's in your glass, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so essentially, the classic Lottie for us, not only is it kind of against the grain in terms of it being unpeated and from Isla, that's already kind of this like crazy weird thing that we're utilizing. But on the flip side of it, and kind of what you were just showcasing is the cask utilization that we do on it is like super like dynamic. It's way all over the place. And it kind of just showcases how you know, not only good barley and good ingredients and all of that, but like casks and all of that, which I know we talk plenty about when it comes to bourbon. Um, when you're utilizing all the good raw materials, some great stuff is going to come from that. Um, you know, Adam actually is under, uh, you know, is our head, head distiller now. And we typically talk about how crazy each and every kind of batch he has to come up with. Because as you can imagine, if you two were to compare your two bottles, they would be dynamically different in terms yeah. of what's inside that bottle. We really look for somewhat of a consistency, but not to the point where we're adding caramel color or we're adding any additives where we want it to just be the same every single time. We really want to showcase what barley can do and what all of this different stuff and just in, inside of a chemist's brain, how that can all be meddled together essentially. Yeah, and, it, and it's a perfect presentation too. It's a lot of the things yeah. that, you know, bourbon drinkers look for. We're looking at non-chill filtered. Um, I know a lot of scotch lovers, you know, they're very big on no coloring added because that was a big thing. Sure. And we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, adding that E150 to add some color to it. You're not going to see that in any Brook Lottie product at all. Uh, again, non-chill filtration, uh, good proof points on most. This is what is this? A hundred proof? Usually? This is a hundred. Yeah. Hundred, hundred proof. Good proof yep. point. Then non-chill I mean, filtered. So yeah, we're getting a lot of that viscosity off of it. Good oily, you know, buttery notes coating it's that. Got, it, it's got like the perfect mix of just sweet. I mean, in here, like I was picking up when I so I just picked up this bottle today because my other one I got was real low. I want to get a fresh bottle just to like see the differences. 
For and sure. um, luckily, this is available here in Ohio. <laughs> um, <laughs> one, of, one of the few, right? <laughs> yeah. So when I tried this for the for the first time, and I was I was nosing it, it it's kind of got everything you love. You, I mean, you really do get those bourbon notes. There's a lot of butterscotch that comes out, but you get all this like beautiful like honey. Uh, you do get the the barley note, but also these beautiful fruit flavors. I think from just yeah. the mix of casts that are there. I mean, you get so much fruit flavor. For sure. I mean, peaches, honey, a little bit of dark fruit in there too that punches through. Yeah, I get. A, I do get some red fruit for sure. Yeah, yeah, like stewed cherries. Yeah, yeah. cherries. I definitely. Uh, I was picking up, um, and I don't get this often, but I get. I get plums. Yeah. But like, you take plums, you like dump some powdered sugar and some van and some bourbon caramel and vanilla all over it, and a little butterscotch. And it's such like an amalgam of flavors, which is really hard to understand when you pour it because yeah. it's so light and you don't think you're going to get that much flavor out of such a light whiskey. It's It kind of goes against the grain of what you would expect in bourbon. Usually in bourbon, you see a light colored bourbon, you feel like, okay, well, that's young. That's not going to have a lot of flavor and it hasn't right. been passed that long where with all the, you know, the crazy maturation, it's just different. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, it's kind of it, it's interesting in the sense because we do utilize for, you know, a ma majority of, like, of all of our different expressions, American oak, which obviously we see a ton of when it comes to bourbon and stuff. So it's a great scotch or, you know, single malt that if you're a huge bourbon lover and you're trying to kind of dip your toe right into that Isla mm -hmm. region, but not go like fully into the peated area. Like, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. A lot of people think that all Isla is peated. There is some yeah. great, Brook Lottie, I think, makes some of the best unpeated, you know, expressions out of Isla that you'll ever taste. Yeah, um, for sure. While, while we're talking a little bit about the classic Lottie, I'm going to show you guys a deleted scene from the film all about classic Lottie. And we'll have Greg talk about this once it's uh, done rolling. So enjoy this, guys. Laddy Classics, our flagship whiskey, is a multi-vintage, so we're not just using one age, we're using four different ages. If I take whiskey at five years old, it's not really been in barrel for that long. It's still quite young and quite spirity and it's still quite strong. It's still got that sweetness from the malted barley. I'm going to take some of that whiskey as my base. Then I'll start to use older profile whiskies whether it's seven, eight, nine years old, that have been in wood for a bit longer. It's got more influence of the oak. And I'm going to use different proportions of these vintages and bring it together to create a multi-vintage whiskey. It's got the nice complexity of very, very subtle oak, but it marries well with the sweetness. It's got the flavors and the DNA of the distillery. The Laddy Classic is about everything that we do here at Brooklady. Yeah, pretty cool guys, right? So that was so that was uh, Alan Logan, who um, who obviously, I mean, is his title? I know he was the he was kind of the distillery manager, but he's also is he the master blender now as well? He's essentially production manager. Production. So he's he's Adam's right hand for a lot of this stuff when it comes to um, even black art. The two of them are really the only two that will know essentially how to make it, what to make what they're doing that particular year. Same with botanists, the two of them are really, you know, in deep with that, so yeah. Yeah, so uh, so Greg, <laughs> I mean, at the start of this film, tell us what what guided you, what was the, what was the inspiration for you to make a film like this? Well, I guess the very first inspiration was, I, I was an exchange student in Scotland when I was in college and my wife had never been and for our 10th anniversary, we went that was three years ago. And we did a walking tour of Dufton and you went to all the distilleries. We didn't go into any of the distilleries because it wasn't an official tour. We were basically drinking drams in the parking lots and then being shipped back home on a bus, which was great. <laughs> but but I, the moment the idea first occurred to me, I mean, I'm a full-time filmmaker, so I'm always looking for, for projects and stuff like that. We were standing outside of Glenfiddich of all places. And the Lid, uh, the lid, the roof was off the still house at Glenfiddich because they were having new stills put in and there were cranes and, you know, it was, a, it was a work site. And I was looking into the still house and just started thinking about what I, I'd always been a consumer of whiskey, but I'd never been really exploring the, the making of whiskey. And that's where the idea really started. 
And at first it was, okay, I came back. My business partner is also my next door neighbor and my good friend, Trevor. I sat down with him. I came back. I brought a bottle of whiskey and I said, here, we're going to talk about this. I want to make a movie about whiskey in general, all around the world. And then it really became apparent really quickly that that was way too big of a subject. That's a big, that's a lofty goal, Greg. That's a lofty goal. That's a lot of ground to cover. (laughs) So then what we said was, okay, let's go, let's just focus on Scotland first and then we can grow this and make more films if this goes well. Yeah. So the the truth is when we started shooting the film, we had no, Brooke Lottie, I made a list of, we had a line producer in Scotland and she was in charge of booking our, where we were going to shoot. And I sent her a list of distilleries that I found very inspirational. Either I loved the whiskey or I loved how they made whiskey or I wanted to learn something about them. I made a list and then she and I kind of winnowed it down about what was feasible because some of them are just too far flung. And <laughs> and Brooke Lottie was one of 16 at the time. Okay. And then it very quickly became apparent that we wanted to focus on Brooke Lottie because the story was so interesting. Mm-hmm. All I think all of the whiskeys we feature in the film are great whiskeys. Stunning. I, I, Stunning and, whiskey. and the truth is, they're all chosen. They're, it's my taste. I mean, the film is a reflection of my taste in whiskey. So, of course, I'm going to think that. And there's a few I didn't get to go to. I we, Kilhoman is not even mentioned in the film. I love Kilhoman, but the truth was, they were getting a new still house built at the time, and they were a work site, so we couldn't shoot there. But Brooklandi not only had great whiskey that I loved; they had a great story. And it was trying to make a film, you know, and it was a really inspirational story about craftsmen really kind of fighting, swimming upstream to change an industry and revitalize this and do it the right way. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it grew into being the front and center story over time. It, it wasn't originally planned that way. It just was really we found it so inspirational. We found Jim inspirational. We found the whiskey inspirational. We found Mark inspirational, you know, and it was just it really kind of sp- spoke to us. Uh, here's a quick question from Gregor. Uh, remind me, at what point did you realize a good angle was to focus on Jim and Brooke Lottick? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. if you meet Jim, Jim is, <laughs> Jim is like, he, he's very charismatic. You know, mm-hmm. he he's, and it, I, I've been saying this a lot in interviews lately, because it only dawned on me after the film was finished. It's e- Jim is so charismatic, it's easy to forget that he's a genius whiskey maker. He could have no personality at all. He could be a complete shut-in who was mute, and he'd still be a genius whiskey maker. Like, the two things aren't the same. And there's plenty of great whiskey makers that don't have the personality and vice versa, but he's just such a great storyteller and so funny and so inspirational and eloquent about expressing that. And he makes incredible whiskeys or, or, you know, has over the years. So Yeah, so if you guys, um, the the I, I found it really interesting, the parallels between Scotch whiskey and also American whiskey and bourbon in general, you know, especially at the times, you know, in the, you know, in the 20th century when things just weren't going their way. So, yeah. um, you know, 1950s demand for, you know, whiskey was huge. There was a huge demand for production of whiskey. Uh, fast forward to the 1970s, kind of like bourbon, whiskey became <laughs> whiskey became dad's drink, and nobody was yeah. really too interested in it. Yeah. Uh, distilleries closed, uh, entire towns, especially in Isla, when you have the lifeblood of the island, you know, coming from those distilleries, you know, entire towns uh, were shutting down. Um, not until the the late, you know, not, not until like 1985. Did we get really the birth of the single malt Scotch whiskey? It started with the blends and um, Johnny Walker and Famous Grouse and all those brands coming to the forefront. Um, that's what what Scotch was known as. It was blended Scotch. The independent bottlers that came after, uh, that followed after, that followed suit. These were the guys bottling single malt variants uh, from these closed distilleries that had barrels everywhere and these. Independent bottle, Gordon and McPhail, you know, Cadenet, all these independent bottles that you know uh, were taking these barrels, putting them in bottles and selling them. And it became like a rejuvenation. Um, and then as we went further down the line, there was a lot of consolidation within uh, within the whiskey make, which is in Scotland alone. A lot of the distilleries were under one umbrella. And then all of a sudden you had um, Diageo that came in. And talk about what Diageo did. I think there was a very, very uh, poignant part of the film where Diageo released the, uh, what was it, the Big Six, I think the it was called? Malt. Yeah. yeah, the, the, the yeah. Classic Six. And I actually have a photo of this, guys. I'll show it to you. This was the Classic Six. As, so I don't know if, Greg, you want to mention that a little bit. Talk about yeah, the Classic Six. Yeah. So, you know, one of the one of the interesting things, especially if you have a photo of it, is uh, Charlie McLean told us this, but it's not in the film, this line, was 
it was really smart of them that the miniatures they released them in were still the shapes of the individual bottles because it, it drove home the point to you that these are six different whiskeys. Yep. And they they are completely different whiskeys and you may have never heard of any of them at the time. Now, the most of these are household names. I mean, God yep. knows, everyone knows Lagavulin. Everyone Obama, knows, most people know Talos. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I, and uh, it's funny, I'm actually a big fan of Dalwini, um, but you yeah. know, these are, most of the whiskeys these distilleries make, other than maybe Lagavulin, still goes into Johnny Walker blends. Mm -hmm. So it, it, this was them saying, oh wait, these are this is the DNA of who we are. This is what we make. And it really kind of was, it was a great way for people to try six different whiskeys without committing themselves to, you know, uh, buying six yeah. full-size bottles of, that they never heard of. Yeah, I, I when I saw that and I saw the minis, I'm like, that. what a great way to introduce, you know, everyone to single malts and how different they can be. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, so then, so then we kind of go through that in the film, get through a little bit of the history. Then we get to Brooklotti and we get to the turmoil they went through. Um, uh, Jim McGowan was, uh, was brought on. Uh, he's legendary showman. Uh, he actually has no like public speaking training or anything. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Sometimes that shows on purpose, but he's fine. <laughs> he doesn't have much of a filter, but it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and the so the upstart Brooklotti was you know, you know Jim McEwen was was a big part of the reason why you know it was brought back. The guy was putting out like what was it like a, a different whiskey every single week it seemed every week yeah every week yeah yeah. Um, Erica, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I think Jason Cousins told me that there was a week in 2009 when there were like was it, oh, is it 13 whiskeys released in one week. Yeah, it was a crazy amount. It was of numbers. something absurd, like at least yeah. a dozen, or it was like ten, or something like that. It was not yeah. it was crazy, crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, that third, that third, especially if you're a collector, that's nuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you it, you know if you go to the Brooklotti Distillery and you're in the gift shop, you can look up and we have every single bottle ever released. And just to put it into perspective, yeah, it fills the entire room in terms of like. We're running out. We we've run out of room in terms of like putting more bottles up on the on the thing or whatever. So that'll just kind of showcase just in its time of reopening back in two thousand and one. I mean, obviously, yes, we can talk about being open since eighteen eighty one since we have been open since then. But like you kind of mentioned, there's been a lot of changing of the guards. We've been open. We've been closed. We've been you know whatever. So really, those bottles are the only ones that we really like kind of showcase in terms of how much we've actually produced since two thousand and one. Yeah, Mark Rainier, who is, um, he's actually the CEO of the Great Waterford Distillery yeah. uh, in Ireland and doing some, so, I mean, he brought, so Mark Rainier was kind of the, one of the, um, I guess the, and Mark, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about this, about terroir and what it brings to a scotch and um did that did that subject kind of come up organically uh, when you were directing the film, or was it something you had in your mind that you wanted to explore? Because, you know, what they do at Brooklotti, and, and we went through, as we showed you, and you know, all the the transparency, and what's in this bottle. I mean, you have it actually will tell you what farm, where the barley grows. Uh, barley growing in Isla was not a thing until <laughs> Brooklotti stepped in, and they said, right. "Why can't we grow barley here?" You know, why do we have to source uh, barley and, and, you know, have it milled and then ship it in? Why can't we grow it here and have a true Isla barley to make these single malts? And, you know, um, one of the things that Jim talks about a lot is they had to early days commit to the farmers that they would buy seven years worth of crops or six. Maybe Erica knows a year, but it, it was a number of years to convince the farmers that they weren't going to just grow this. Then the distillery is just going to go bankrupt or disappear. And then, you know, they're not going <laughs> to. So yep. they, 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 they kind of converted back to barley, which, as Mark says in the film, hadn't been grown since the world, First World War um, on Isla. And, you know, Mark now has is doing a similar terroir experiment in Waterford as well, um, including yeah. the terroir codes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I was lucky enough to get a couple samples of some of the Waterfords. And nice. already, already it's really it's impressive stuff. It already. is. And it already I mean, it's already pretty, you know, obviously it's young. But it's already got. You could tell there's a base of flavor there that's gonna. Yeah. Once oh, yeah. That, that stuff matures. Um, so Jimmy Gwynn, uh, not only. Uh, well, first, first tell me, Mark. Uh, Mark, how? 
I'm sorry, Greg. Uh, what I'm reading Mark's uh, chat, uh, Mark Broda from Scotch for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what's uh, what is, what is Jim like in person? I mean, is he, <laughs> is, is, he as, is he as explosive as he seems just like talking to him? I could, I could probably sit and just listen to him talk for hours and not say a word. You know, yeah. um, I'll tell you something I'm very proud of is I knew going in that when you talk to someone, not that I've ever done this, but when you talk to someone like a Mick Jagger or you talk to someone or, or even a politician or something like who has spent their lives in front of the camera, who has spent their lives telling stories, one of the things you have to do is talk to them enough that you kind of get beyond the stories that they are just have locked and loaded at all times. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. we, we, I think I interviewed Jim, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five times. And I mean, and to the point that we were kind of wearing him out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but it was great because, you know, we, we kind of got to talk to him. I mean, he tells the amazing story about the, his, his mentor in the film. I don't want to ruin that because it's, Probably the emotional highlight. It's a of the film. great part of the film. It is. Yeah. It's a great part of the film, and I don't want to mention it either because it's, yeah. one, of those, it's but, one of those ones that I actually, you know, I I kind of teared up a little bit. You get goosebumps. Well, yep. So one of the things that we wanted to do with the film was we were acutely aware, and this is something that differs with Scotch than any other. Maybe in Ireland you'd get this, but you wouldn't get it anywhere else in the world. You could get it nowadays in, in the bourbon world, but not to the not to the length of of Scotland where there's this history of a master and apprentice, master and apprentice that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. In Bourbon, yeah. you can certainly get it going back 200 years maybe. But mm -hmm. in Scotland, you can go back 600 years, you know, and they don't even know. Like they, they But we, all of the storylines that we told throughout the film, we wanted to kind of say, okay, here's the master, here's the apprentice. This is what he or she handed on to him or her. And we have, you know, a couple different, other than Jim and Adam and Alan, there's also David Stewart and Kelsey McKechnie, at at Balvenie, you know that's a big thing that's featured in the film as well. Yeah, but uh, I'm sorry, back to but back to your original thing. You know, Jim's exactly as advertised. He's he's the exact person you think that he is. He's, you know, the the very first you see a lot of the stuff in the film where he's hiking on Isla and on the cliffs and everything like yeah. that. What he that was the very first day of the shoot, and what he told us was, I was going to take you to a cave that I like to go to, but it rained for the last three days, so the cave's going to be swamped. But let's go to this cliff. Quote, it's a couple hundred yards off the road. You guys will be fine. <laughs> it is not a couple hundred yards. It's probably Greg, Greg's, miles like, Greg's like, get the drone. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's probably two miles off the road. And yeah. it was through a Scottish bog. And our entire crew was carrying 40, 50 pounds Production of beer. Stuff. Right. So were you like walking in peat bogs? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, the, our sound mixer fell through a little footbridge and got went up to his knees <laughs> in, in, in mud. Amazing. So I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I was the director of the movie, so I wasn't carrying anything. I was just talking to Jim the whole time while we were like, like uh, drinking a dram while you go up the go up the <laughs> hill. Like rough guys. You everybody okay back there? Okay. So yeah. you know, um, but that's the that you know that was that was Jim's exactly. That's how he is, and. Um, that's it was wonderful. The the I mean I I'll, I've been a filmmaker for twenty years and I've never enjoyed a shoot as much. I mean, well, I, I, mean how, I mean how could you not? I mean so first of all I mean visually the film mm. is just gorgeous. Yeah. I, I mean, agree. The, um, the, the, the the filming of the not I mean obviously the distilleries have their own sort of just romance and beauty to it, but. I mean, when you see like just guys like thieving, you know, out of the barrels and the slow motion like pours into the glass, like that's just like, oh my god, it's I romance. Go there. It's I wanna, so it's total romance. I want to go there right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we always said we wanted the film to look like whiskey. Uh, mm -hmm. We were ready to we were ready to shoot in June of that year, and I yeah. in, insisted we wait till November because I wanted Scotland to look like it looks in Scotland. November. I didn't care. Right. I didn't want it to be pretty. I wanted yeah. it beautiful, yes, but not yeah. pretty. Yeah. It's not Hawaii. Or Miami, you know. Mike Mike Meyer wants it on Blu-ray. He needs that scenery on Blu-ray. Make <laughs> make um, make it happen, Greg. It's all <laughs> just just scenery for the background. It, the, the film was shot in 4K. It okay. will be on Blu-ray. It will be on streamers. It will be on DVD. Um, we didn't realize DVD was still a thing until we went to Germany, where DVDs are still very popular. Oh, huge! Yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll be all of those places. It's just right now. I mean, this is like I said earlier. This is this is what would be our theatrical run and this is us you know trying to y'all are y'all are all in one theater with us right now that's <laughs> yeah exactly you've got so, your uh, you've got your your ticket to uh ticket to ride for a uh, for a theater so uh so, so jim McEwen, uh they hire him he takes over brooklotti he 
he hires Adam Hannett and Alan Logan and, and a couple of other people, you know, that actually, you know, lived on the island uh, because, you know, the distilleries in Isla are interconnected. It's the lifeblood of the island. Um, so I'm going to get the Isle of Barley ready as our next ex, uh, as our next expression to drink. And while we're doing that, let's meet Adam Hannett, head distiller, and uh, talk. And you guys get to see another deleted scene from the film. Here we go. My name is Adam Hannett, and I'm the head distiller at Brooklandy Distillery. My title was, was an interesting thing in relation to taking over from Jim McEwen, master distiller decades of experience in making whiskey. For me, stepping into those shoes, there was a lot of people watching, a lot of people seeing that, so I, I had to be honest about it and I had to, for me, I didn't feel like I could walk up and say, yeah, I'm a master distiller too, because I'm taking over from someone who's a whiskey legend. I suppose I'm a good example of Jim's legacy, where you know he's, he's created an opportunity for people on Isla where you can, you can fulfill your potential. When somebody gives you the opportunity, you want to prove that you made the right decision. You've got to have experience. You've got to put that into practice. You know, to be in the same bracket as Jim McEwen. So you've got to earn that. Cheers. So cool. So cool that he won't call himself Master Distiller. Um, no. Whiskey Central mentioned he won't call himself Master Distiller. Such a cool guy. Um, yeah, Steve A, such incredible footage. Absolutely. Uh, Steve, hey, I could see this running in the background on a large screen with no audio and people would still be spellbound. Oh, yeah. yeah. 100%. Totally. Yeah. totally. It's, it's that beautifully filmed. So a nod to Greg there as well. Thank so, you. Uh, I, I, that's, that, I, I'm, I always tell people that there's two types of filmmakers. There's storytellers and then there's visual artists. And I am a storyteller. Uh, unapologetically, I'm a storyteller. But I'm smart enough to surround myself with, with visual artists. And <laughs> the, the, uh, I mean, it, you know, or lazy enough, I don't know, but I've, but what I've done is it's, it's really Brad Kenyon and Alphonse Palima are two of our, yeah. our, our, our drone pilot and B camera and, and uh, Brad's our cinematographer. And it's that the visual work is them. It, it, and uh, you know, I've just gave them a list of what to shoot and they just delivered it in spades. See yeah. the bourbon, see the bourbon wrench here, Trev. I don't even drink scotch. I really want to watch this film. And that's, yeah. And that's really what it's about, guys. This isn't when you watch this film and you learn about the lifeblood of Isla and whiskey and the distilleries and what it went through and what it means to them and the resurgence since, uh, you know, 1985, 19, uh, 1986 mm -hmm. and what's happening there. You see a lot of parallels like we did in bourbon, guys. I'm telling you. Bourbon's in the middle of this boom. Uh, Scotch whiskey is experiencing the same thing. We have... Greg, how many new distilleries have opened up in the past? Oh, God. You you mentioned that you mentioned a good amount of them. How many do we have now from you know that original like you know um, the ones that were all consolidated? How many new ones do we have now? On Isla or just Scott? on Isla on Isla alone. Yeah. Three, on Isla, right? Well, there's there's one built and Ardenho is built and operational. Ardenho, there's two yeah. more. There's two more that have been approved two on more. Isla. Yeah, so three. There's there's 27 in Scotland, I think, operational. And literally yesterday, two more got approval, like building yeah. approval. Yeah. I think there's going to be 40 when it's all said and done. Um, it's it's insane. It's absolutely yeah. insane. Um, uh, and then that's not even counting what's going on in, in just the mainland. How many oh, yeah. how, how many new distillers are popping up on the mainland? Uh, but that's what I'm saying. There's like 40, 20, when, including oh, the mainland. Four, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, um, Kilholman and Arno uh, on Isla. Yeah, is that? Yeah, is uh, that Isla now has nine functional distilleries that are open yeah, yeah. right now. There's yeah. um, Brooklady, uh, Brooklady, Beaumont, uh, Bunahaven, Kalila, Ardnaho, Lafroig, Lagavulin, Ardbeg. Well done, yeah. Kilholman. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, Greg just knocking him off. Well, he lived it for how long? I, I, how long? I know I'm like I know I'm in alphabetical order. I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the trick Rachel McNeil taught me. Three, three, three. There's three uh, southern ones. Ardbeg, Lafroy, Lagavulin are right next I've to each other. I've never thought of it like that. Three middle ones, which is Kilhoman, yep. Brooklady, and Bomore, and three northern yep. ones, which is Bunahav and Kalila and and Ardnaho now. Yep. Oh, that's and a then good elixir. Way. I, I that don't is know a where elixir is going to be built. Yes, oh, uh, Port Ellen is part is 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 coming. I just saw the comments. Yes, yeah. Port Ellen is on its way. So Port really, really open. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. 
I was just going to say some really cool personalities made their way into the film. You get you had Ralphie, yeah. who's an absolute whiskey tube legend <laughs> uh, in the film. So Ralphie's in there. A whiskey a go girl who yep. uh, does a lot of work with the uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. She was in it. Um, so there's there's some familiar faces in there that you guys uh, that you guys might uh, might you guys might know. Uh, so before we dive into the Isle of Barley, we have another deleted scene about the Isle of Barley uh, coming up next for you guys. And let me see. I have it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We don't have one about Isla Barley. I was confused. We have it for Octomo and Port Charlotte. So uh -huh. with that, anyway, talk us talk us through Isla Barley. Sure. <laughs> and I think, you know, you guys were kind of briefly discussing it. And this is just something I think unanimously, like the chat and everybody can agree upon. It's a quote in the movie. It's one of my favorite ones. It's like, if you take a, if you take a, you know, a sip of, of whiskey and you can't appreciate it, then go drink vodka something along those lines, but I think we can all agree, like yeah, yeah. bourbon, whiskeys, you know, Japanese, scotch, whatever, like we appreciate the art of making a really good whiskey and that is globally, right? So mm -hmm. I always love that line. It always cracks me up and um, yeah. So with that, uh, Isla Barley. Isla Barley for us is- um, there are Yellow she can. There she is. Um, so sh essentially what this one is, is more or less really showcasing uh, barley on the island of Isla, right? So we, uh, you know, we gave mention to it that we've employed these farmers, which has been really important for them in terms of putting the, you know, the economy essentially back in order and, and really ensuring that the people that are growing up in the next generation and all of that kind of stuff can continue to work on Isla and don't have to go to the mainland. So my whiskey and reaction should be good. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the uh, that was the line from the yeah. There you go. There it obviously, is. Obviously, obviously Shayla from Whiskey Central. There has you go. It a few See, times. I was like, I'm gonna butcher this a little bit, and I've, and I've watched the movie four times. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we really want to showcase not only again going back to kind of ingredients matter, material matter, all that, but that barley matters. And I say that you know I've probably said it one time before um, on one of you know one of the times that we've talked, but when you kind of compare it almost to like a wine, if you, if, if you're a big wine drinker and I say a Cabernet from Texas tastes the same as a Cabernet from California, tastes the same as a cab from anywhere, you'd be like, you're crazy. They don't taste anything alike. Like they've got different terroir. They grow in different soil. The grape varietal is somewhat different. It's all mm -hmm. different. So when I say barley matters, it's where are we producing it? How is it getting, you know, plucked up from the ground, what kind of barley is it, so on and so forth, that all matters. And so essentially what our 19 essential farms do, they are all scattered throughout the island of Isla, both, you know, centrally located, right on the coast, all that. So essentially what you've got is those central located uh, farms are going to get a lot of that exposure to elements of, you know, sun, rain, wind, all of that kind of stuff. And then on the, the, the coastline farms are going to get that salty breeze from the ocean penetrating through that barley, giving it more of a salinity and salty note and all of that. So we really try to showcase for this expression that more or less that the ingredients going into a single malt really, really matter. Now, Jason, the, the tube that you have is actually one that we we haven't made a yellow tin in a couple of years. So it looks like I need to to give you a new tin. The new tin. I know, I, I've been, this is one of my favorite Isle of Barley. So oh, I, 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 I nurse this thing. <laughs> hey, the 2007 Rockside. I, anybody that watches this later from my from my team is going to laugh at me because everybody talks about Rockside. But everybody has their favorite types of oh, yeah. Isle of Barley for sure. Uh, Greg, which one's that? He's got the 2011. 2011? Yeah, I can't find the 2012 yet, but this is the 2011. Um, I, I'm drinking 2011 tonight too. So, so again, guys, just like the classic Lottie, non-chill filtered, obviously with this with this color. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all natural color. There's nothing added here. This is this is straight, beautiful cask maturation. So, in so when we're talking about the differences between classic Lida, classic Lottie, and Isla Barley, the classic Lottie kind of has more of the sweetness, more of the more of though those heavy finish uh, influences that you get the dark fruit flavors, the light fruit flavors, the the butterscotch, the bourbon notes, the Isla barley, the barley is the star of the show. The barley really comes through. There's a there's a cereal there's a cereal type aspect to it. Almost like I pick up 
uh, Fruity Pebbles cereal in it, Honey yes. Nut Cheerios, <laughs> stuff like, like, like that. Yes, yeah. like a graham crackery, whatever. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Graham, yeah. Graham crackery is actually a, a perfect, you know, word for it. Yeah. But again, this one, um, so it's, this one's also a hundred proof, non-chill filtered, no yeah. color added. I mean, this is what we look for in American whiskey too, and it's right here in um, in Scott. Just you know, and the. Uh, Again, when I talk about transparency, they tell you exactly what farms the barley came from, uh, you know, the where, age. It, yeah, the age, it. where it was sourced yeah. from, all of it. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you know, uh, one of the things that Jason, that, that, that Jim speaks very passionately about in the film, but also all the time, is the only thing Jim, I think, loves more than he loves whiskey is Isla. And it was really important to him that these are families. It's like these are this isn't just some random farm that you just think of a farm. This is literally a family and they don't have to move away to find work. They don't right. have to grow something they don't want to grow to find to, to pay their rents they or their, their mortgage, you know. Right. And it and it keeps people on Isla. And uh, you know, it and and you know, Brooklotti, I think is other than the other than the government, I think Brooklotti's the biggest employer on the island. Correct. And, and I, it's we used to joke, we have so much footage of Jim talking about meeting people. You see it in the film about Adam and Alan, but other people we'd say, you can start tomorrow. And we used to laugh all the time about like someone, Mark, or someone had to say, Jim, you got to stop hiring everybody that walks through the door. We're just trying to get started here. Well, you know, Alan, but Alan's in the, the film talks about it, but Alan, who is now, as you guys know, production manager, started as a painter, yeah. uh, had no painting experience, but he started as a painter mm -hmm. and look at where he is now. And then you've got Adam Hannett, who started as a tour guide again. Yeah no experience, just love whiskey. It just, it shows so much. I think of the, and, and this goes for a lot of different distilleries on the Island of Isla. They really want to give to the next generation of people coming in. Cause they, again, want to give that lifeblood back into the Island. They don't want people to just move away and kind of it just, you know, upside turn or something like that. So it's been really fun to see all of these people kind of go from like very humble beginnings to <laughs> like it's that, that was that was one of the more that was one of the more poignant parts in the film when Jimmy Gwynn talks about uh and his you know it's basically like he he's kind of the almost the the overseer of the island and looking out for the different communities because a lot of the distilleries that were there you know they they grew over the years and then these towns built around the distilleries so without the distilleries the towns would kind of die and he was kind of the one making sure that didn't happen for them yeah, um, absolutely. Greg, Greg, what was your indication from from Jim, you know, when it came to that idea of, I mean, was that passion, you know, to kind of like his love for Isla? Was that was that apparent from the beginning or did you kind of learn it as because I feel like in some respects, maybe some people might not want to talk about that, but he just seems like he wore it on his sleeve. Absolutely. And, you know, he I, I know that his own grandfather was was on Isla, but had to move away to travel. He was a merchant Marine and like sailed around the world. Yeah. And I think that there's a sort of a sense of he was, he was, it wasn't some vague idea to him. He felt the experience of it. These are people who have to leave because there's no work. And Isla had a really big uh, cheese dairy, uh, cheese uh, creamery and it yeah. closed. And that was like the, what that was at the lowest point of whiskey. Then the, then the creamery closed and all these farmers didn't know what they were going to do. And to bring oh, yeah. this back to Isla Barley, they convinced all these dairy farmers, okay, switch to, switch back to barley that you did a hundred years ago. And we essentially yeah. started that in 2004, um, whenever we yeah. were kind of plugging that back into the farming industry and stuff. We They were like, no, you're crazy. This isn't going to work. And they've seen so much pros progress. And to them, you know, it, they're farmers at heart, but they actually get to experiment so much with, you know, genetic barley that hasn't been around since the you know 60s and 70s that they're able to now grow on the island. It's there's a lot of other reasons why it's super important. I did see in the chat that there was a question about um, you know, did the bottles change or the canisters change? So the canister changed to the silver gray bottle, but each individual bottle is going to be different year over year. So whoever we're utilizing farming wise or the the grain itself might be different in terms of what gene it is. So um, there, I like to think of them almost like a vintage, just like a wine or something like that. Each year is going to be different based on climate, environment, so on and so forth. That's that's why I was showing the bottle here because yeah. you can actually. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can read this, but these are literally that's a map of Isla, and you can see the names of the farmers and yep. on the teams. It actually it doesn't have their phone numbers, but everything else you can you can pretty <laughs> much find out. Like this is this is yeah. some vague concept. This yeah. is literally Raymond Stewart. You know, I know it's that's just a name that popped in my head because I know he's one of the farmers. But uh, you know, yeah. these are 
specific people that grow for them and their family uh, farms. They're not big uh, agri. Yeah, JG, I've never had a Brook Lottie. What would be go run and get the classic Lottie? Um, if you've never had a Brook Lottie, uh, and if you're more of an American whiskey bourbon drinker, yeah. start yeah. with them. I always I've converted more people to scotch with two bottles more than anything. One is the Brook Lottie Classic Lottie, mm -hmm. and the other one is the Buna Haven 12. Those those two bottles I convert more bourbon drinkers to scotch than anything. Yep. Uh, and yes, I did see the chat that Isla is a place you can stay. There are mm -hmm. there are very, very small inns, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. but you can absolutely stay on the island. I highly recommend it because typically, well, it, there's only two flights in and out each day for Isla. Uh, so you get in early in the morning and it's very hard as you can imagine, because the island is very spread out, but to get back out that night. So typically I always recommend if you can stay the night, do it, experience some of the like, you know, scene at night, get some good grub, have a drink. It's, it's fabulous. So isn't there, isn't there a thing where some of the distilleries like allow you, like they have like a special like program where you can work at the distillery for like a week. Yeah. They, that's, they, they, they do what, have a few of those. That's what, um, I, that's what I want to do. Oh, so man. I've told, I've told, I've told them so many times. I'm like, I'm happy to take a summer internship and just go for, you know, I, you don't have to pay me. Yeah. I'll just go for free. <laughs> I'll, I'll paint, I'll paint and fix barrels. Right? And, and Amen. Freaking, I'll get, I'll get the old monkey shoulder. Why yeah. not? Yeah. I mean, Greg, <laughs> Greg knows this as well as people that have been to Isla it's essentially my church to, to a lot of degree because I just feel like everything slows down. Everything is just quiet and yeah, yeah. the people are just super like lovely individuals. And uh, it's just such a place that I just feel like I'm like getting back into like my zone or whatever. It's, it's a very Zen like place for sure. So, uh, here's a good question for Erica. And this is one that I was going to bring up. Yeah. Um, I, I think Greg has a, I have a bottle of this too. And it's a, the bear barley. How, how did the decision to release the Bear Barley series come to be? It's such a unique barley strain. It definitely took me a minute to wrap my head around the taste, but wow, I love it. Yeah. Um, again, it kind of goes back to, you know, Jim's essential love for barley and now Adam being able to kind of look at, okay, we're utilizing really great barley, but what can we use in terms of maybe barley that again, hasn't been around since the seventies or eighties um, that we stopped growing because as you can imagine, grain became very commercialized. You know, we use yeah. it for bread, we use it for blended scotches, we use it for all these things. And it, it wasn't so much of just really honing in on do, does barley really taste different between different genes of barley like we don't really so it's been a really fun project for them to truly start you know absorbing the different types we have organic we have bear we're going to come out with more um but again that's just another one that is super unique and, and fun to taste for sure so this is the, this is the can of the bear barley right here guys yeah. and my just bear like, my bear barley's down the hall i don't have it on me <laughs> just, like, just, like, uh, just like greg's just like greg's barley to show it shows the map of where yeah. the barley came from and it's it's a very earthy rich type yeah. of barley um with that let's show another deleted scene we have uh head distiller uh adam Hanna talking about experimentation so let's uh, let's hear from him great said we took risks you know we started using casks that nobody was maturing whiskey in because we knew the quality of the oak and if you have quality, you're always going to do something good and you're going to take your whiskey to where you've never been before. That's where we want to go. We want to try and experiment and improve our knowledge. We're only making single malt for ourselves now, so we are not under pressure to make huge volumes. Giving yourself time you know, to make the best whiskey rather than rushing to fill a quota to be efficient, that's not what our aim is. If we just did the same things as anyone else and bought barrels, you know, American bourbon barrels, and filled the spirit in there because that's good and didn't learn anything else, we'd still make great whiskey. But there's always that question, that curiosity. How can we improve? How can we change? What flavors can we add? Where can we go? And that's the roller coaster ride we've been on over the last few years. Love it. And, and, and that actually brings me to the next part of the film that I really enjoyed when we talked about Greg McEwen all of a sudden learning how to use the different cask maturations and how the scotch. What, what is it? What is it, Greg? Like the scotch, uh, the scotch law of Isla? Like what, yes. what, what? No, the Scotch Whiskey Association basically saying that they couldn't do things. And yeah, because no one had ever done it before. And I'll tell you, when you asked earlier about what made me focus 
I saw this in the chat and people have asked us a lot, you know, were we paid by Brooke Lottie? We were not. This is a completely independent yeah. film. We were not paid by Brooke Lottie. Mm -hmm. I, I truly, deeply felt this story. And one of the things I was so inspired by was the fact that their creativity and their experimentation was born not out of some sort of luxury, but out of a necessity. Mm. They, they needed better casks because the cask that the whiskey that they inherited was garbage. The casks were garbage and they knew they needed better wood. And because Mark had so much experience, Mark and Simon had so much experience in the wine industry, no one was using wine casks. No one was using wine casks. So they said, let's let's get these wine casks and do stuff. And the Scotch Whiskey Association. And, and Erica, I'm, I'm, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Brooklady is still not a member of the Scotch Whiskey Association, right? <laughs> <laughs> Erica's about to go run and hide right now. No, it's okay. No, no, no. I mean, you know, we, we play nice. Um, right. <laughs> we play nice, but I think, you know, and Greg kind of already alluded to it, but a lot of sc Scotch whiskey, they, they like to, to some degree, and I, I don't want to talk too much out of turn, but um, they want it to be a, you know, pretty even playing field so to speak, yeah. right? They want everybody to be able to distill and make beautiful stuff and whatever. Um, they just like to kind of cover up some of maybe the things that they're doing behind the scenes and they don't want to showcase and all that, which is completely fine. However, as you know, kind of we, we already mentioned, we don't really believe that. We believe that whatever you're putting in your glass, you should probably know what the hell it even is. Um, you know, how we make it, where it's made, the, you know, all of it. So um, that kind of, it, it, it kind of, Torks them out a little bit. They don't really love that, um, but you know, I, I, we have to play. We have to play nice in order to, s to stay in the stay in the game. Sure, but I do, I do <laughs> love. That, I know. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just I, I do. I do love that the Scotch, you know, whiskey association is. You know, they, they were so against it, and now everybody's doing it. Right. Yep. I mean, yep. Every, and uh, that it's, that actually it's going to change. I think yeah. you know, with with time, just like you know, we see the shift with what we eat what we, you know, what we drink, how we, you know, live day to day as humans, you know, all of that shift has, has happened in time. And so I think it's just a matter of time before. And it, and it, really brought, it, it. And, it and it brought us to another part in the film, which was uh, David Stewart of Valveni, who was, I don't know if he was the first, but he was, what was he kind of like the first big brand to use not only American Oak, yeah. but then combine that with Spanish Sherry Oak to make that. And, What's funny is Balvenie, when I watched it, I'm like, you know, that's the reason why I loved Balvenie and I wanted to try different scotches. I loved the combination of sherry and ex bourbon together because I feel like you got the fruit and you also got the vanilla caramels from a bourbon cask together. Right. So uh, tell us a little bit about that, Greg, and talking to him. Well, I mean, it's funny. I, I always say that the whiskeys with brands of whiskey that have really established uh, master blenders or master distillers, they take on the personality of the people. And, and I, that's certainly true of Jim. And I actually feel like it's true of Brooklady under Adam. Yeah, like the changes, if you know both of them, you can feel the changes that a Adam's personality brings to it. Yeah. And, and, and Balvenie is very much like David Stewart. David Stewart, <laughs> the, the, the best thing I could say, I'm not the best, I mean, I could say a lot of wonderful things. He's a wonderful guy, but he's been the master blender at uh, Balvenie for like 54 years now. And he's like the third most senior employee there. Like yeah. he's the young guy. There's two people there that consider him the kid. And, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's uh, and that says everything you need to know about Balvenie. I mean, it is deeply, deeply steeped in its own history. They, they'll, they'll unapologetically tell you that they are able to draft behind Glenfiddich. They're, you know, it's the same family that owns it. And Glenfiddich is the one, Glenfiddich is Toyota and <laughs> Balvenie is Lexus. It's, 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 it's the that's premium right. brand that is able, they don't have to do the volume. They don't have to, they can experiment. They can try new things. They can do wonderful things. Yes, and, you that's know, a David, really, that's a really interesting way to put it. That's cool. Okay. And well, David Stewart says in the eighties, he's like, well, I just thought it might be interesting to mix these two and try these two different things together and see what it would do. And I mean, at the, as this is actually a direct line from the film that Charlie McLean says, it was a fundamentally you know, groundbreaking thing at the time. It was just, it just rocked the world of, yeah. you know, I, I mean, this is in the eighties when not as many people were paying attention. Yeah. But and and that's, that's the part where I kind of, when I saw that part in the film, I was just like, wait, really? I like, I have like two bottles of that, like just sitting downstairs in my whiskey room. I'm like, and when you see it on the shelf, you don't realize like what an impact that oh, yeah. bottle had on the industry. So next time any of you guys watching, go on the shelf and look and see Balveni 12. Just realize what that bottle did for the entire lineup of Scotland, all sitting next to it. Yep, absolutely. Okay. 
and, and you know, and it's funny, one of the really truly lovely things about Jim and about David Stewart is they have a huge amount of respect for each other. Very, very different people. And I actually asked them, they did an event together like two years ago. It was Richard Patterson, who's kind of like a Jim, and Jim and David Stewart. Yeah. And I asked the people about Benny, how does David do an event with those two guys? <laughs> and and uh, Gemma Patterson is the global ambassador. She said it actually works out perfectly because he's in the middle. You start off with D Richard Patterson, who's like the circus barker. And then you go to the, the, the professor, which is David Stewart. And then you end yeah. with the comedian, which is Jim, you know, and yeah. he's making everyone laugh and everyone's yeah. on the chairs. And yeah. It's like, it's the, like chairs, the highlands, yeah. Yeah, just getting everybody riled up. Yeah. You have like, you have like Felix Unger and Oscar Madison. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, couple, couple questions here before we get to the Port Charlotte. Um, uh, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Uh, given the cooler climate, how long does the scotch typically need to age for? How would a young scotch be? Well, uh, I'll 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 give my thoughts before um, Erica probably schools me on here. No, I, I feel like peated scotch can get away with being a little bit younger. That's why you see an Ardbeg five year old wee beastie on the shelf. You the smoke can hide some of that youth note to it. Um, whereas a scotch that needs a little bit more maturation, as far as you know, if you're using different barley's, if you're using different wine casks, uh, or maybe just one single wine cask. If you're just doing a pure sherry malt and you're just letting that age to get the flavor out, I mean, what, I feel like it needs eight, 10 years, you would think? Yeah, I mean, I always kind of think of this this to be a little bit of a conundrum in terms of how to answer it. I mean, many of you guys have heard the story of how we kind of came about the you know, the 10 year old is better than an eight year old, which is 12 year old is better than a this. And that, you know, that was almost more of a marketing ploy in terms of like yeah. showcasing the different ages and how they can be better than one another's, all that kind of stuff. Um, I say this and I, I truly mean it. If, if, if a product out there, not even just Brooklady, but anywhere in Scotland, whatever have you, if it's made with good materials and good raw ingredients, it's aged in the proper casks, it's, then, you know, either it's blended or we, you know, it's the non-chill filtering, it's the proof. There are so many reasons why sometimes age doesn't matter. Um, certainly, yeah. certainly we come across um, some that we feel that they're young and um, this goes for any distillery. And you're like, oh, you could have probably used another year or two in the barrel or whatever. But then you have some and you like even Octomore is a great example where we've, oh, come, sure. out with, we've come out with a three year old. And it's beautiful. It drinks like this beautiful, smoky, caramelly, whatever. And, you know, that just goes to show the, the people behind the, the scenes and the curtain, all that is Oz, know exactly what they're doing. All right, because I, I kind of set you up to that because I, I feel that I, I was hoping you would say that because I feel the same way, especially Optimal. when it comes, even when it comes to American whiskey. I think in, the, in this day and age, yeah, a, age is a... Age to me is, is a marketing term. Yeah. It's it's great to have a nice big, you know, fucking 10, 12, 15 year age statement on it. Absolutely. And everybody wants to run and get that. Yep. But you you have amazing distilleries. Uh I mean what the Isla Bali is what, six years old? Six, seven yeah, years old. Usually, yeah, usually we're about six years old. And that's the youngest. Yeah. That's, and the, that's, youngest. And that's the youngest. I mean, but you yeah. have you have bourbon makers, American whiskey makers that are putting out uh, amazing bourbons that are three, four, five years old. Yeah. And you yeah. just wouldn't, he's focusing in on his. Yeah, it's, no, it's, <laughs> this like one here. has six years old on it. it, it yeah, six years old. I mean, so if you're using, like it, like Erica pointed to, if you're using the right grain, you're yeah. making it with love, you're making it, you know, the right way, good wood, you have great distillation, you know, I mean, we could talk about Texas whiskeys, what's coming out of Texas yeah. at only two, three years old. Uh, we could talk about stuff that's coming out west in American whiskey, and the same goes for you know Scotland. You there, you know, age doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it if you're a young distillery putting out two year old whiskey and it tastes like shit. Yeah, chances are it's you're the older it gets, it's still going to taste like shit. Yeah, it's um, it's you're casking it wrong or the yeah. liquid the liquid. So a lot of times what we talk about is like liquid going in is of course going to change with a cask and everything, but if you're putting bad liquid in it's not going to be great liquid coming out no matter how many times you cask it. So uh, 
yeah. ensuring that you're really focusing on every single part of the production process is super important. Hopefully everybody on here is a barbecue fan or, you know, whatever. Barbecue in and of itself is a great kind of comparison because like what? Ribs, mesquite stuff take for, you know, longer, all that kind of stuff. You get the age on it and you get different like flavor notes. But then if you just put like, you know, some hamburger on the grill or whatever, it's going to be like flash fire really quick. But they're all freaking delicious. They're all, you know, really good in their own right. But they're all going to taste dynamically different if they're made the right way. And they put. Thanks, the Erica. Now I want freaking brisket. Thanks, no, Erica. I want, now, I want, now I want barbecue. So whatever. Uh, here's a here's a good question for Greg because he was kind of in the trenches with uh, talking about um, the the barrels. What is what is done if anything? They use bar bourbon barrels before they put new spirits in them. Do we when they so a lot of the used bourbon barrels that come into Isla come into Scotland to be used. You know, is anything done to them before they're refilled? Do they get kind of refurbished a little bit? It depends on the distillery. Um, there's actually yeah. a popular technique now called STR, mm -hmm. um, which some distilleries use. I, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Brooklady does STR we, cast. We don't, no. Which is uh, shaved, shaved, toasted, and recharred, right? Which mm -hmm. is basically yeah. mi minimizing what was in there before. Not getting rid of it, but just lessening it because you don't want it to be too aggressive. And... That was kind of in, innovated by uh, the late, great Dr. Jim Swan, uh, who is referenced throughout our film, but uh, he passed away four years ago and we weren't out. He is a, Jim Swan's influence on whiskey is absolutely, it's amazing. It's like one of these, I'll, I'll make an American football comparison. It's, it's like one of these football coaching trees where there's like a coach who's got like 12 coaches that were apprentices of his. It's like the, like, the Bill, like the Bill Parcells tree. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I was, yeah. I was, I'm, I'm old and I'm, and I'm a, I'm from Pennsylvania, so I was going to make a, a, a Chuck Knoll Pittsburgh Steelers reference, but yes. Oh, Bill there Parcells you go. There you go. I, I get, yeah, I can get with Chuck Knoll. Yep. But uh, uh, so you yeah. know, um, the there's Jim Swan helped create Kilhoman and Kavalon and I mean and just so many distilleries, and he he innovated the STR thing, but. That being said, I think the idea for a lot of distilleries is to do as little as they can. They want the cask influence. They want what they can get from it. And I know that Jim is a huge fan of bourbon casks. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've really been in good. events with I've been in events with Jim where people have spoken ill of bourbon. On event, and Jim always says, "Look, if you want to hate bourbon, go ahead, but then you should just think of it as a really great proving ground for the whiskey that we make because yeah. it's still we're still yeah. getting those casks and if it wasn't what it is and Jim and Jim loves bourbon. Um, you know, he said, this is th these, there's a, an absolute unbreakable tie between us and bourbon because of, uh, the huge role bourbon casks play in classic Laddie and in, in lots, I mean, almost all Brook Laddies, right? Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I've had, I've had comments. Uh, there was this one guy for like a month that every video I put out wrote, it, it was the same comment for like, like every video I wrote, he wrote, uh, bourbon is checkers while scotch is chess. <laughs> And I would write back, well, if it wasn't for bourbon, your scotch would have no fucking flavor. <laughs> right. Like, it goes back and forth, right? Like we're supposed to help all, we're all in this love of whatever art, yeah. if you will. So we're supposed to, to love it here's, all. Here's a, here's a great question, because this is one I never even thought of. And this comes from my buddy, Daniel Carter, DC. Why the name Brook Lottie? Where did that come from? So it's Gaelic. And it is a, a small hill or a small slope, essentially, um, in Gaelic. I think is is the rough the rough translation. I could be butchering that, but yeah, uh, it's, it's it's the small slope by the shore, right? By the shore, there it is. And yeah. I, and there's a book called Pete Smoke. Oh God, what's it called? Uh, Jim Jeffords wrote it, but I can't remember. Uh, Pete yeah. Smoke and anyway, but he talks about the names, and he said all of the names of the Isle of Distilleries were basically originally directions for the ship's captains who had to dock there to pick up the whiskeys. You want to go yeah. to the one by the sloping shore by the water. Ardbeg yeah. is also one. I think Ardbeg yeah. means like the high point high by the point. sea. Yeah. Yeah. And Ardnaho is the high point by whatever Naho means. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but the, you know, they, they all are reference. They're all geographical references to the different points where the puffers would have to go to pick up the whiskey. Yep. Uh, Big Vic coming in with the first super chat of the night, showing me some love. Thank you so much, Big Vic. I love weeded bourbon. What do you recommend to try? I have never try. I have never had scotch. Uh, Big Vic, man, go with the uh, 
Like I said, I mentioned the two earlier. There's a classic. few for sure. Yeah. Brooke, yeah. Brook Lottie, classic Lottie, or get a uh, Bunahab in 12. I think it comes down to, I, I mean, if you're really into kind of the weeded or cask expressions or anything, see what they're making it with. Like what kind of casks are they utilizing? What kind of like source yeah. of green and stuff? Because that'll, I always say people that like weeded bourbon, you know, it's not going to just be beam products or it's not going to be just, um, you know, this kind of product. There's so many types of weeded bourbon out there, right? So you kind of kind of just try to dip your toe into whatever is similar in style. So. Um, yeah, but I'll, again, we mentioned Balvenie Double Wood. Balvenie Double Wood is a great one. Yep. Absolutely great one. And also yep. uh, one that I that I just had in my head that I forgot. Oh, the, uh, the Glenfiddich 14. Yeah, yep. uh, yep. absolutely. Which is and pure, which is pure ex-bourbon. I mean, they're they. It's all ex bourbon maturation, so that one's a really good one too. Yeah. Um, okay. The uh, the this is actually a dated box now because they the, the, they changed their labels. But the Benromic Organic is yeah. all virgin oak, and the virgin oak gives it that big kind of vanilla kick that you get in a lot of bourbons. And I always tell people that the uh, um, Benromic Virgin Oak is a really organic. Sorry, yeah. Benromic Organic Virgin Oak is the is a really great stepping off point, and I'm a big yeah. fan of Benromic in general. Yeah. Thank you, thank you uh, so much, Zach Andrews. He is uh, one of my patron saints of whiskey. I love that dude. Thanks for coming in tonight. Uh, Everyone is here. Nice to see you, man. Uh, Steve Burko has a great question. Historically, when do the exchange of barrels between spirits start? How early did Scott start to use bourbon barrels? I love the innovative, curious nature of spirit makers. Great question. Prohibition, Prohibition is a <laughs> yeah. huge, big, uh, a, a big part of it because yeah. what happened was the American. The American lumber industry got got themselves involved in the post post prohibition legislation and said that yeah. casks could only be used once. So then all the American bourbon makers thought, well, what can we do with this whiskey, or what can we do with these casks rather? And then Scotland said, well, we'll take them because all of the original a lot of all of the original Scotch sellers were retailers, were grocers. Like Johnny Walker was a grocer, um, yeah. Gordon McPhail was a grocer, uh, yeah. Dewar was a grocer. They would put the whiskey, they would age it, not on purpose, just be, to store it somewhere. Farmers would bring them spirit and they would throw it in casks. So whatever they had casks sitting around of, and you know what they imported a ton of? They called them Italian warehousemen and they imported a ton of wine and sherry. So they had casks sitting around. There's Gordon and McPhail actually has records. And this is actually really funny of different casks that they tried to age spirit in that didn't work. And the two, my right. two favorite are a cask full of nuts and bolts. Yep. <laughs> And a cask full of fish. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> oh, yeah. They've done all kinds of barreling stuff, like Tabasco and all, you know, they've tried a, a ton of stuff over time. Like, just, yeah. Wait, they tried, they tried, they tried them them nuts time. and bolts and fish. Yes, that was <laughs> tried. Yeah. Oh, my God. What was Probably Gordon McPhail? delicious, you know? Why not? <laughs> oh, God. Who doesn't want a metallic -y, like, <laughs> you know, whiskey or, like, fish guts in there? Oh, yeah. Uh, Deanston makes a great organic virgin oak yep. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree Absolutely. With that. So uh, let's get into our next deleted scene, guys. Ooh. Access here. We're going to talk a little bit about the Port Charlotte 10. Here's the deleted scene all about that one, and here it is. I had no knowledge of what Port Charlotte was like when it was operational. But there was one great old gentleman uh, called Roderick McLeod. He was a stillman, and he said that he remembered Port Charlotte, the taste of it. So I remember saying to Roderick, I think you're the last man in the world to taste the original Port Charlotte. He said, oh, probably, Jim, it would be me, yeah, probably. He said, if you like a wee dram, I might help your memory. He said, oh, yeah. And it came to the, the million dollar question. Roddy, could you tell me what it was like I said, Jim, it was good. <laughs> I said, Jim, man, it's good. Was it peaty or heavy peated that lightly peated? Heavy peated, Jim. So that was all I had to work on was this, the fact that it was heavy peated and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, for those, so for those of you guys that don't know, that was Jim McEwen talking, and you could see his... Charisma, yeah, charisma. yeah, his his, jo his like jovial personality and yeah. how passionate he is really comes through in that he's really the star of the uh, of the show. So, um, so Port Charlotte, ten year heavily. Now we're getting into the peated stuff, guys. Woo! Um, give you guys a little bit of a close up here of this beauty. Yeah, uh, Port Charlotte, ten year old, heavily peated Isla single malt. Um, again, non chill filtered, a hundred proof. 
Uh, no color added. You guys can see how light it is. And the so if you guys, anybody out there has ever had like fear of Ardbeg or Lorforg or even Lagavulin, uh, have no fear because Port Charlotte, I think, is, is, <laughs> is yeah. Oh, look, she's rhyming now. She's rapping. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Isla Barley is is that peat that's that's uh, that's so just ubiquitous through Isla and all the distilleries that use peated uh, or that create peated scotch, but the Port Charlotte to me has this nuance of just such incredible sweetness. Uh, Eric, why don't you talk about that? Where that sweetness comes from? What are the what are they maturing this in? Is this ex bourbon? We got some sharing here. What's what's the deal with Port Charlotte? Yeah, so uh, Port Charlotte, for just a really quick background, uh, is actually a place, right? Hop, skip, jump down the way from Brooklady Distillery. Um, it's part of the port on the water. There used to be, as Jim was kind of making mention in the, in the movie, that there was a distillery there at one time called Lock and Doll Distillery. That distillery is no longer there anymore, but they were one of the you know very first people to start utilizing peat and all of that. And we have records of it back in the late 1800s, essentially. So um, Port Charlotte has so much character to it. The 10 year old is the one I'm drinking right now. Um, and that is gonna be the youngest inside of that bottle. Um, oh. And we essentially do almost more of a slow and low approach. And I say that, I, I, I mean like the, the low temperature of essentially it, and then the slowness, like the longevity of like how long we're doing this for um, to dry up the barley. So um, just like charcoal or anything to dry up barley, we're either using just hot air for the most part, or we're utilizing the, the peat, which is the decomposed grass, vegetation, all of that, clumping it into little bricks firing it up in the kiln with the fire because it's actually a great heat converter. If you ever go to Isla and it's a really cold night, it smells like peat in the air because a lot of people smoke their chimneys and stuff with it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody kind of, we, we joke because a lot of people have their own peat bogged like areas where they cut their own peat and utilize it for a bunch of different things, smoking, smoking fish, salmon, so on and so forth. Um, so we do ours on a very low temperature when we're trying to dry out that barley for a very long time, um, which gives it a different characteristic than some of the other maybe peated products that you guys have drank before um, in terms of scotch, whether it be Ardbeg, Lafroig, so on and so forth. Um, and that's part to do with the barley and part to do with just that approach that we take with it. Um, casks for us for this particular one is gonna be a virgin oak and American oak meaning like bourbon mostly, and then um, also a, a cognac uh, cask as well. So we're getting kind of a, a, a mirage of essentially a lot of different barrels going on in there. And you get a lot of fruity floral notes off of it, but you also get that smoky, but caramelly note as well. So oh my God, this is, I just took a sip of this and <laughs> the, 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 like the sweet barbecue smoke that's in this is what's most, yeah. is what grabs me. It, mm. This is going to sound weird. This is like if you took some grilled peaches with honey and caramel and you threw them in a bowl with like burnt ends. Yep. yep. And then you just Absolutely. eat and then just eat that. That's what's yep. in the glass. Yep. Yeah. I always say it's kind of almost like a, I always really describe it with barbecue and like sweetness and savory notes. So that was dead on. I also say s'mores because that graham crackery, ooey gooey, marshmallowy, char, vanilla, caramel. I get a lot of marsh. I get, I get a lot of marshmallow on the nose. It's, it's, it's in yeah. there, but it's kind of, and you also like, when you think about s'mores, you got a campfire smoke, there's all kinds of different, yeah. you know, things going on. So. It's like when your marshmallow catches on fire. Oh yeah. And you have to blow Char it out the, real quick. Char the hell out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Greg, tell me about the peat bogs. I think that's, that's a part of Isla mm -hmm. and a part of that goes into it. It's a huge part of whiskey making in, in Isla. What, like, what is it about the peat bogs? What makes it, why, why are we, why are we drying the grain? Why are we drying the barley with, with peat bog? What, what's so special about it? Well, can, can, I'll get super nerdy for you on that if you like. Yeah, yeah, I want to, I, I saw, listen, the viewers know I like to get nerdy, so get nerdy. Well, so I saw a question a while ago saying, what about, the, why do they use peat there and not say in Louisiana? And I'll tell you, they you can use peat in Canada. Louisiana okay. is too hot. They're, and and actually Westland Distillery in Seattle is starting to use Washington State peat. So that okay. you can, you absolutely can. It's just, it's just, it's too soft in places like yeah. Louisiana. If it was really cold and you got the permafrost. Dense, I, yeah. As Jim said, it's just halfway to being cold, you know? 
Um, this is this that's, is yeah. This that's is, what that's what uh, that's what um, uh, Troy mm-hmm. popping to watch him said because he's oh excuse me he's actually from Louisiana yeah and he said yeah. God if God forbid you use the pee from Louisiana it would taste <laughs> right, like yeah. shit. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't, I mean it wouldn't burn well. There's just so many attri- you know attributors. Here's to something that. I learned while we were making the film, and I, I find this fascinating as a giant nerd. Was what happened was all of Scotland and Ireland used to heat themselves their homes with peat because it was mm-hmm. everywhere. There's not a ton of trees. There's mm-hmm. a lot of rocky stuff, but you could burn this peat, which is like dirt that's halfway to being coal. In the 19th century, they built train lines. You know where they built train lines to? To Speyside, where all of the unpeated whiskeys come from, to Dufton and that whole region, to the Highlands. Yep. There's train lines. And so bit by bit, people stopped burning peat because you could get coal or clean natural gas lines. You know where you can't run a train to? An island. So, <laughs> so Isla never stopped. Isla never stopped using peat as a heating source. Yeah. So as as smoky whiskey fell out of uh, fell out of favor. That's hard to say when you've had three drams oh, of whiskey. Out of favor. Um, Dude, it, we, haven't even, we, haven't, favor. we haven't even we haven't even had the Octomore yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I don't have to drive anywhere. So um, there you go. so. All whiskey at one point or another, and I showed a Ben Romick bottle a few a little while ago. Ben Romick is an incredibly traditional whiskey that still uses a bit of peat smoke. It's just a hint of peat. Yeah. And because they do it by choice, but all of the whiskeys in Speyside, bit by bit, stopped doing uh, um, drying their barley with peat. So Brook, uh, Brooklady and all the other Isla distilleries kept doing it because they needed to, because there was no way to get coal efficiently, financially efficiently, or gas certainly out to the island. So then it became popular again. It, people loved the peat. And so they started looking for peated whiskeys. And a lot of them had stopped doing it. And it's funny because that's one of two examples we have of Bricolati benefiting from its neglect. And Alan Logan told us this story that uh, about their equipment. Bricolati is still made on Victorian era equipment. And he said they yeah. Bricolati benefited from being neglected for 100 years because if they hadn't been neglected, bit by bit, all of that equipment would have been replaced every 10 oh, years, yeah. there would have been new stuff. Remanufactured, and, computers, and people, all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And people ask me, oh, do they still display the Victorian era equipment? I was like, no, they don't display it. They use it. <laughs> they use it. <laughs> the crazy part. <laughs> they, they, they have they it on display. To... Yeah, they freaking yeah. Honestly, they're using it. You can it. walk right through the distillery <laughs> and see for it yourself in the <laughs> chalkboards and everything because there's not a single computer in all of our distillery. It's chalkboards yeah. and records that date back hundreds of years and all kinds of stuff. So, and the only uh, the only big yeah. and Erica, tell me if I'm wrong here, but I think they, they told us that the only big technological change in the distilling process was that the grist mill used to be run by a donkey walking in a circle, Correct. and the donkey yes. has been retired. That is and- that is that is the joke. That is the joke. So back in um, 1881, we were like horse and buggy, like that was a thing, and now we are actually able to push it. So well, we've come uh, and and so- we've gone from um, steam to gas. I think as also or you know electric or whatever. So that's another. Yeah you know, huge step, but you know, yeah. is what it is. So um, the, as Pete has become, you know, smoky whiskeys have become more on vogue again, you know, and mm-hmm. one of the things that is so different and look, I will say this, I'm a, I'm a huge Laphroaig fan, a huge Laphroaig fan. Yeah. Laphroaig, Lagavulin, um, Ardbeg, all three of which I own right now, all three of which I own, they do something on purpose. They, they just still quickly, they have small stills. They want that kind of harsh, fiery edge yeah mm-hmm. Jim's idea was well wait let's do it like Erica said low and slow let's mm-hmm. let's go the other direction and we'll bring an elegance to it there's an elegance to the smoke that's not like Lafroy and I love yeah. both of them I'm not Jim actually one of his favorite stories is about his his he his perfect dram was he was in Miami and he drank a Lafroy during a hurricane on a balcony in his underwear story. while smoking a cigar it's such a good he, story he was so desperate to be back home he drank a Lafroy <laughs> because it would remind him of home and he sat on a balcony of his hotel room in his underwear cigar. smoking a cigar watching a, a hurricane hit <laughs> Miami such a good story <laughs> oh so, my god that's crazy nothing yeah. there's nothing but love for Lafroy here it's just a different approach that's all it's just yeah. whether you want that that kind no, of for sure. punch in the and, face and, and, and that's a, and that's what i alluded to earlier if you want to punch in the face you can go ard bay you go to Lafroy. there's um, so many even yeah. though even the young lagavulin some of the peated kilhomans you know for that sense really kind of punch you in the throat with the peat yeah this this is definitely a softer approach to the peat yeah. it's a little bit more sweet peat rather than that harsh, you know, yeah. charcoal, uh, creosote type uh, flavor sure. profile. Exactly. Yeah. 
it whispers in your ear, then it punches you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Hello. It's, it's Hello. A little bit, a little bit too easy to drink, and then when you wake up in the morning, you you feel like you just smoked a cigar, but you yeah. didn't. Um, uh, earlier, oh, that was the one I was going to highlight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Erica, what was the inspiration behind making Isla Barley editions of Port Charlotte, and will yeah. we ever see a peated bear barley expression? Great question. And this that question is, uh, gives me so much happiness. That's, that's Donald Rance. Uh, he is a huge fan of Irish whiskey. I, I've ha I have coined him the uh, whiskey, the Irish whiskey Yoda, which is why you see that profile. The Yoda picture. That's pretty yeah. great. So yeah, yeah, he did call it out. I, I put the bottle up because then people were like, "Wait a second, there's an Isla Barley Port Charlotte." There is. Yeah. Um, so essentially, within our, the fold of Port Charlotte. So real quick, you have Brooklady, which Brooklady has the all the unpeated versions. Then you have Port Charlotte. Then you have Octomore. Port Charlotte in and of itself has um, just the, the aged ones that we showcase the, the 10 year old. We also have Isle of Arley expression. And then we also have a cask expression within uh, Port Charlotte. So three different expressions underneath the Port Charlotte umbrella. Isle of Barley for us within the Port Charlotte is just showcasing again, how barley can really influence again into even a peated expression. So kind of a, another one that just kind of blows your mind. To answer the bare barley, I, I don't think we've done it yet, but don't be surprised because I've heard about some of the stuff coming out and it is going to blow your mind. So, hey, little mom, and let me punch you in the face. Poor Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> it's so good. There's a, as far as that question is concerned, I, I don't, Erica probably has a much better insight into what's coming than I do, but I will say this that I, I actually was on an event with Adam the other week, two weeks ago, and he was yeah. asked that question. Yeah. And he said they are very interested in experimenting more with bear barley. The problem is they, they, they have so little bear barley every year that they want to make it all into bear barley, the regular bear barley whiskey. They, and he, he gave some number. I don't, I didn't memorize the number, but it was like less than 1% of the whiskey it's they, small. they, is, yeah, and so he yeah. said, sure, would we love to do an Octomore or a Port Charlotte with it? Yes, but it's just a matter of we get so little of it because it's very, very difficult barley to make whiskey with, which it's is why it fell out of favor. super finicky. The very first time, I think the story goes, is the very first time that they were um, – using it within the, the mash and everything, it started to essentially bubble over. It was getting so thick. It was just like, kind of just like gradually growing almost like the blog. And it took forever to clean out the the mash and Turner and all of that kind oh, of stuff. Oh God, what a mess. What a mess. Um, so again, just like anything, when you think about cooking or whatever, utilizing new ingredients, it's going to be a brand new experience. And, you know, grain doesn't just come in one, you know, size fits all. They're going to react differently to um, kind of the process and when they're, you know, the tr transitioning and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, we, we see it in American whiskey too with a lot of the craft distilleries using spelt, they're using oats, yep. Uh, yep. they're using all different types of grains. Uh, oats, I heard, is a fucking mess to work with. <laughs> yep. It's like, it gets really clunky and it gets really. Well, and I mean, like, think about it in your yeah. oatmeal. It's like sticky and it's yeah, sticky. sticky. If you have like oatmeal after, yeah. like you have a couple yeah. like stuck to the bowl, it takes forever to clean that out. So it's a very finicky, again, grain to work with. So, yeah. So, uh, so everybody in the chat, uh, uh, Richie Z has dropped it in the chat. I just dropped it in the chat. Head to that link, buy a ticket, watch this movie. It's, uh, we have Father's Day coming up on Sunday. If your dad is into scotch, uh, single malt, or just in whiskey in general, uh, you have to watch this film. It's an absolutely there's, – there's times in that film where you're not only attached to um, the – we talked about the romance of Isla and the romance of the, of the spirit and the community that, that kind of hovers around whiskey these days. But I think there's a connection – uh, I, I forget. I think it's the I think it's the writer from I think it's Whiskey Wash, one of the writers in there who says that yeah. he can look at a bottle and it sees it's like 15, 20 years old. And, and he says, wow, my grandfather or my father was this age when. Oh, when uh, yeah. Whiskey jug. Whiskey jug. Josh whiskey jug. There it whiskey is. Jug. There yeah. It is. When, when this when this uh, bottle was uh, was put in a cask. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that and just kind of enjoying it for Father's Day. Guys, I'm telling you, watch the movie. It's one of the most. It's, it's a love language to not only just Isla, but just the, the the single malts or the whiskey process, just all of it. Again, if you're not a Scotch, you know, huge Scotch fan, that's completely fine. I think you'd still appreciate the art of making a really good whiskey in um, general. I really appreciate you guys saying that on my yeah. on our behalf because I will I will say this: my mother in law does not drink alcohol. She's not allowed yeah. to, and 
she's watched the movie a number of times and that was yeah. she i've always held her up as the sort of person i wanted to make a film that would appeal to mm. because it doesn't <laughs> this, I'll, I'll, look I'm, i i shouldn't say this during this event but i'm going to say it this movie's not about whiskey it's no. about people it's about the people who love whiskey but it's about people and I, I would love nothing more people ask me all the time when is this going to be on a streamer i would love it will be on a streamer i would love nothing more but the truth is we have to make back the money that we spent of our investors to make this film yeah. and this is the way we do it and i i would love nothing more than to just give this film to the entire whiskey world and we will but uh this is this was a love letter and it was a labor of love for us to make the film and we're hoping to do more films about spirits and we have some really cool stories lined up about other types of whiskey, other parts of the world, about American whiskey, about Irish whiskey, uh, but also about mezcal. And, you know, you know, we, we've got some really cool ideas that we want to keep telling stories about spirits and the people. Yeah, Greg, make- I mean, Greg, you can end up being like the Pied Piper of telling these stories for whiskeys around the world. I mean, I think there's a I think there's a there's a. It's like a dark corner of, of whiskeys that we don't really get to see. I mean, I think a lot of what goes on in Japanese whiskey is kind of a mystery. Um, Indian whiskey as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, even Irish whiskey, the boom. I mean, Irish people, a lot of people don't realize that Irish whiskey is the fastest growing whiskey segment in the world right now. Um, it's absolutely booming. The amount of distilleries that are all, that are popping up in Ireland, it's incredible. Um, so, I mean, that's a whole story in, in, in Absolutely. And of itself. Um, so, I mean, you could, you could probably work, uh, you could probably retire just making whiskey <laughs> films, dude. I would, I, someone just wrote in the comment of the Ken Burns of Whiskey Docs. I would love to be the Ken Burns of Whiskey Docs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know that my liver would love it, but yeah, I would no. love to be. Um, but look, the truth is, we have found incredible stories about people, again, not about the whiskey. Look, the, the the big challenge. If you're making a movie about f- uh, uh, food, yeah, people can't taste the food. People yeah. can't taste the whiskey. So you need to tell a story that inspires people to then go taste it, and that's yeah. what we yeah. try to do. And I've always said we were inspired by the Chef's Table, which in turn was made by the people who made Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And then what we did is we reached out. I, 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 full full disclosure, I was on my kids are in Cub Scouts. I was on a Cub Scout hike and I said to one of the moms, she's like, Oh, what are you working on? I said, I'm making a film about whiskey. And I mentioned the chef's table. And she said, Oh, my next door neighbors are the editors of the chef's table. Well, guess what? Our film was edited by the editors of the chef's table because she introduced me to them. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we we wanted to tell that kind of story where yeah. it looks and feels the sensory experience is similar. And I cried watching it, and I don't get very emotional. I'm just like, I got a little ups, I got a little, little couple tears. Yeah, Erica, Erica basically watched the film, and that little Tin Man got her heart that day. <laughs> just like opened up, like, oh, no. yeah, it was like it was like the Grinch when it just kind of breaks. <laughs> um, all right, guys, so I'm gonna show you another deleted scene, and we, while we're playing that, we're gonna get our Octomore ready. So hold on, here comes another deleted scene from the film. Uh, all about Octomore and the farm that it's produced. Here we go. My name's James Brown, and we got involved with Brocladi in 2000. I'm very proud to grow the barley for Brocladi, plus in supplying of spring water. Our barley is kept specifically for the Octomore. Now you a big island and it's a very fertile island, surrounded with the salt water. Different soil here, we don't get the big tonnage that you would in a mainland farm, but what we do grow is very successful. And I think it must be the salt. I always knew we had this pretty source of water, which used to feed for Charlotte Village. I said to the Brocladi, we've got good water here, and one thing led to another, they were wanting this water to reduce the whisky. And now the distillery has moved on to do gin, so they use spring water for the gin. To think the water goes all over the world, the barley all over the world and the whisky. And tremendous sense of achievement, yeah. Oh, oh, the gentle giant. I, I, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that guy looks like he's about eight foot tall. He's he's very tall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, James Brown is, is a very tall, tall man, and he is just sweet as candy, for sure. So uh, so interesting story about Octomore. Um, 
Jimmy Gewen talks about it in the in the film a little bit about the 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 creation of it and how a lot of the distilleries I and mean, we talked about Ardbeg and and Lafroy and how they kind of like you know if you're not making a peated whiskey you know you're not a true Isla distillery um so Jim's Jim's idea was okay you want us to make a, a peated whiskey Ardbeg, Ard, Ard, Ardbeg and Lafroy kind of measure out to what, 55, 40, 55 something uh, ppm. Yep. He's like, we're gonna make we're we're gonna make a, a peated whiskey that's gonna make that look like child's play. <laughs> so this and this is this is the maverick type of uh, mindset of Jim McEwen and why you fall in love with him watching the film. So he's like, we're gonna make Octomore and we're gonna go up over two hundred ppm, which is Pete's. Uh, peat parts per million, um, which is a huge and and you would think being a oh my god that's way too much peat I don't even want to get near that fucking thing, but because as Erica alluded to earlier they do this low and slow type of distillation for this and get so much flavor out of it. Now this is this sexy ass bottle <laughs> is the Octomore ten point four, which is a virgin oak. Uh, maturation. Now, this is only, I shit you not, three years old. This is a three-year-old <laughs> bottle. And look at look at the beautiful color on this, guys. Look at the look at the color on this thing. Let me see if it will focus up here. Uh, there it goes. Look at the color on that. This is virgin. Now, this is a uh, French oak. Am I am I right, Erica, for the ten point four? Correct. Any point four is going to be a virgin oak. Yeah. I've I got, mean, I've got the point one tonight. So, I mean, just absolutely ridiculous. So, so Greg, why don't you tell us about your introduction when they were talking about Octomore and, and uh, what kind of made it such a such a kind of like a cult hero type of whiskey? Well, one thing I'll tell you uh, is I want to say this because I love James Brown so much. Um, James <laughs> Brown. James Brown signs his emails as, as handsome farmer James yep. Brown. Yep. <laughs> which yep. immediately made me love that guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so he, w there's four, Erica, correct me if I'm wrong. There's four Octomores released every year. Correct. Version three is exclusively grown on James Brown's farm every year. The his correct. farm is called Octomore Farm. Yeah. Which means, which by the way is Gaelic means the big eight and farms used to be divided into sizes. And that's hundreds of years ago, what that farm was called based on Octo. Yep. Yeah, Octo, yeah. And um but the idea behind making Octomore was, you know, like like Jason already said, it was to make this insanely peated whiskey. But what Jim <laughs> had this idea was let's do it like the way people smoke salmon, which is with as little heat as possible. Let's not mm -hmm. use the heat, let's just use the smoke, not the heat. And let's let it. And and the reason it's funny because Brooklyn, the only thing that Brooklyn currently doesn't do on Isla, is their their is their maltings. They do that on the mainland of Scotland because the only the only maltings that in Scotland that would do this with them, this ridiculous experiment was was Baird's maltings in Inverness, who would isolate their grain and and just and and malt it for four days instead of like you know I don't know how long a normal malting is twelve hours. So it, it exponentially longer. And yeah, the, the, uh, the, the salmon, the smoked salmon, uh, the way he described it. Yeah. It really, really kind of, it clicked with me. I'm like, holy shit. That's why it's that, that long and slow, yeah. just, just smoke, um, you know, kind of, uh, that, that age, it's almost like you're just aging it with smoke rather than just hitting it with pure fire. It's, right. a, it's a really interesting way to get, I mean, and you get that flavor out of this and it's, it, and for such a high PPM, it's never a, a punch of peat that could be like too much for anyone. There's a, there's a, there's a delicacy to it. It kind know? of just blossoms a little bit in your mouth as you kind yeah. of. Like, um, yeah. I, I mean, I know everybody, I know everybody watching here is probably like, oh, Jason's fucking just, he's. He's, they're he's, here, so he's saying that. He's waxing poetic <laughs> about this whiskey because they're here. But, I mean, honestly, I really do have a huge appreciation for what Brook Lottie does. Brook, Brook Lottie and Boonahaben are the two distilleries that absolutely made me jump headfirst into yeah. Scotch whiskey. Yep. And, and that's why it's an, that's why this the movie, the story, the distillery is so 
you know, and obviously, guys, when I first learned about Brooklady, I didn't know all this history and everything that they went through and Jimmy yeah. Goo, and I only kind of learned about that along the way. Yeah. The actual transparency and what was in the bottles were really is what grabbed me first and foremost. So hopefully, if none of you guys have tried Brooklady yet, maybe watching the film will make you try it a little bit more. But the Octomore is a very beautiful um, expression. Erica, why don't you tell us a little bit about what goes into making? So usually for uh, every release each year, there's a so this is 10.4. So we'll have a 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 10.4. And then so on the following year, 11.1 and so on. So right. tell us what, what kind of goes into that and what's Adam's mindset these days with creating these Octomores? Yeah. So the last two years, both the 10 series and 11 series, I would say that Adam kind of wanted to, to push the boundary even more in terms of, you know, the age being really low, meaning like maybe it's a three year old or whatever. And then the PPM is also really low or maybe it's really high. Um, I think that the great part about Octomore is that we don't know nearly what we're going to be able to create with this yet. Um, there's so much opportunity within, you know, this particular range because when you're essentially drying out the barley and you're kilning it and all that kind of stuff and it comes out and you do that measurement of the PPM, we don't go in there and say, okay, we want 309, you know, come out 309 and we'll use that. It's very yeah. much a, whatever comes out is what's going to come out. Um, so, and that depends on, you know, the barley that we're utilizing, how we're smoking it, whatever. So a lot of the time, this is just as much fun for, for them that, it, you know, as it is for us, because they don't know fully what they're even going to create until they start creating it. Yeah. Um, so that's been the beautiful process of, you know, Jim really thinking like, okay, what are the, what, what, what else can we do? Like there, there are no, there's no limit to this. Um, and then Adam essentially taking that and just kind of saying, okay, this is what Jim's done. Now let's, let's play with the age even more. Let's go down and not up. Let's go, you know, high, high, high up to, I think 309, which was, was one of the most recent ones that we came out with. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's this process of, of ever evolving and you're going to see more and more and more um, as the years kind of go. Yeah, and they and there's a lot of different cast maturation issues with Octomore. You can yeah. when they release them each year, you see, I mean, they actually will name the distillery they're they're getting the barrels from, guys. So like you'll see Jim Beam Bourbon Barrel. Yep. Or you know, you'll see like the name of the distillery that they're using to age some of the stuff in. But this Octomore to me is like if you took a creme brulee and you put it on a barbecue and cooked it. There we it's, go. It's got so much smoke and richness to it. Um I'm actually, Greg, I'm interested what, when, when you talk about how you're a fan of, uh, I mean, you love Lafroig. how does, how does Octomore kind of measure up to, you know, with that? Is it, is it that different for you or do you still like that, you know, punch in the throat from Lafroig? No, I, I love both, but I will say I'm drinking the 10 four and the first note, the first tasting note I, or nosing note I get off of this. The first one is diner bacon. Like oh. the bacon that you get yes. with your cheese omelet at like a greasy spoon grease. diner. Grease. Yes. Grease. And, uh, grease. And yeah. uh, the other thing I'll say is I've, I've actually said this to Adam before. It would be very easy. You know, look, I assume almost everyone watching here tonight's an American. There's loads of places around the country here that you get a free T-shirt if you eat the whole giant sundae or the huge steak. And, you know. <laughs> It would be very easy for someone to make this whiskey where you're like, this is, you get a free t-shirt if you manage to drink this. This is not that whiskey at all. No. At all. Yeah. This is not a challenge to drink. I mean, it requires you to kind of shut up and pay attention, but it, it's, yeah. I don't mean, it's, diff it's not difficult to choke down. It's beautiful. And, yeah. and again, I, I swear to you, I'm not getting paid to say this. It is absolutely a beautiful whiskey. <laughs> it is just yeah. this incredible dance between wood and spirits and mm -hmm. smoke. And the smoke is definitely there, and there's a ton of it, but it's not like Lafroig at all. Lafroig, you kind of have to kind of – the thing I just – like let what of the virtual Feshiel was last week or two weeks ago, and, yeah. and during the Lafroig day, which I watched, I love John Campbell, I love Lafroig, right. you kind of have to get yourself like, okay, this is a Lafroig day because everything I'm going to eat or drink the rest of the it's day gonna is going to taste like Lafroig. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just a different thing, whereas this is this incredible – 
well, I, I hate to use the same verb, but it's the only one that keeps coming to mind. This is like a dance again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's this balance. And I think that's what Adam probably sets himself to do, which is uh, to find the things that will balance this out. The right wood. And that's why I love some of the, the French oak versions of, of Octomore, because I think they balance. I have a special soft spot in my heart for wine finished Port Charlotte's, where I love that sort of sweet red wine mixed yeah. with the smoke. You know, yeah. there's there's a whiskey, there's a, a, a distillery exclusive Bricklotti released one time. I shouldn't even mention it because you'll never get it. But I hope, I, look, I hope maybe somehow I'll influence them to release this. But it was called MNC, and it was this red wine finished Port Charlotte that was absolutely gorgeous. And I love it. I dream about it. Whenever I drink it, I call it my dream whiskey because whenever I drink it, I have a dream about it that night. <laughs> I have a, I have a Port Charlotte that's finished in, uh, which one was it? The MC... The MC01. Oh, it's, MC it's, it's, uh, it, it's finished in Marsala cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah MC01. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, Marsala was a big thing growing up um, uh, with my mom, with my grandmother, because she used, she used Marsala wine, you know, for cooking. Yeah. So my, if there's, there's going to be one I want, it's going to be that one. And it has like this sweet and, awesome. earth, and, and earthy, there's almost like a savory, like, uh, like garden basil note to it. That, Ooh, I've never gotten basil off of it. Now I'm getting basil. Yeah, it's like yeah. a it's like a like a sort of like a, so, I don't know like a herby herby note. Yeah, it reminds me of my grandmother's garden. That's why I love that one. That's so, so great. If 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 anyone here has ever been to the Brickbody Distillery, they always have two casks for sale in the shop right. that are distillery Valencia yeah. like exclusives. And this one was a 2005 MNC, which is was a Chateau Chateau Costier de Nîmes. Mm -hmm. It's a French winery. It's a red wine. And there's just something about it that speaks to me. And it's what I also love about Octomore. I promised I, myself I was going to bring this back around to Octomore. I love <laughs> the way, I love the way the smoke and the red wine dance together. I just, there's mm -hmm. something my palate loves about it. I mean, and when I, when I heard the 10.4 was French Oak, I'm a huge French Oak fan, wow. and especially even there's some Texas whiskeys, uh, some bourbons that age in French Oak that I'm absolutely in love with. Um, the, the Balcones uh, French oak, or the Froak, as they call it, yep. is one of the most amazing you really know, Texas whiskey I've ever had. Yep. Um, Jason, is your mother Italian? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> uh, so, but isn't this the case where PPM is only the metric to go by? I swear I've had some 55 PPM uh, Belechins that punch me more than Octomore with a much higher PPM. Love them both, but they're different. And yes, I think that's a testament yep. to the way Octomore distills yep. and smokes their peat with that, it's when when I saw that in the movie that he uses it and, and he used that salmon, like the smoked salmon part, and they use the smoke rather than the fire as more of the element to get yeah. that flavor. It was kind of like a mind blow. I'm like, oh, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, it, it totally blew me away. Uh, my daughter's name is Isla. Uh, I should probably stock up on some more Isla Scotches. Yes. Isla's such a great name. <laughs> that's really cool. That's a yeah. great name. One of our one of the producers on our film, uh, who is Scottish, uh, she lives in Scotland. Her daughter is named Isla as well. Yeah. Such a um, all right, guys. So uh, we're gonna kind of finish up here real soon. Um, any any further questions for Greg or uh, Erica? Please uh, get them in now. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to play one last clip, a deleted scene um, that I think encompasses everything we've talked about, and you guys. Uh, exemplify in the chat every week and not just on my channel but all over whiskey tube and all and everywhere else so I, I just want you guys to pay attention real close to this clip it's a deleted scene uh from the movie but i definitely want you to uh to pay attention to this one it's um it ones that it, it definitely hits close to home here we go isla is what makes brutality brutality it connects to everything that we're about. It's the place that we make the whiskey. It's the people from this island and it's the influence of Isla that drives us forward to do what we're doing. We're not trying to create a million litres of whiskey here. We're driven by flavour, not by yield. We're trying to create lots of interesting whiskey using an array of different styles of casks. We're fortunate enough that people care about the way that this product is made. 
We have huge satisfaction in making whisky here and then watching people from all over the world come to Isla. It's hugely rewarding. You know, the people we work with, the people that are drinking our whisky. To me, whisky is community. Yeah, whiskey, whiskey is community. Um, I think I think that was kind of the biggest thing I took away from the film. Yeah. Um, that, and, and, you know, I we've talked about this, how every corner of the world, color, creed, religion, no, no matter what it is, you come together, you drink whiskey. Uh, it's this collaborative known thing and you can just kind of sit down, have a dram with somebody. And I think the chat every week and what we talk about here on the, you know, just in whiskey tube alone, and outside of that, just uh, going to different events exemplifies that. So my question to Greg is, uh, what's kind of the number one thing you took away and learned after making this film? You know, my answer changed from five months ago when we did the first screening. If you would have asked me before we did that, I would have talked about my love of Scotland or something like mm -hmm. that and my love of the, the heritage. The unbelievable embrace that the whiskey fabric around the world has given us in our film mm -hmm. is absolutely, it, it makes me emotional just saying this. And, and that, that's probably a little bit inspired by the amount of whiskey I've had, but, but <laughs> the, 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 it's getting soft. <laughs> we, have, we have made so many great friends around the world. Yeah. I mean, tomorrow night I have a call at 10 o'clock tomorrow night with a bunch of people in Japan who are going to do a bunch of screenings there. And, you know, the next night I have a thing in Taiwan. And it, I can't tell you what that means to me. I mean, okay. uh, we, you know, we're just this, we're this group of eight filmmakers that are, are in Los Angeles and people love to say Hollywood, that we're Hollywood. And yes, I can see, if I go out front of my house right now, I can see the Hollywood sign. That's the truth. But there's, we're an independent film. We're not financed by Hollywood. We're not financed by Brooklady. We're just a bunch of whiskey lovers who get along really well with each other and just thought this would be an amazing story to tell. And it's just been an incredibly inspirational journey. And I would love, like I said earlier, I would love nothing more than just to share the film with everyone right now. And, uh, you know, we're just doing our best we can to share this with everyone. And it's been an incredible experience for, and the cool thing is, is for me and my friends and like, like Jason and Erica, I've never even met either one of you in person yet. Right. And I, yeah. That's the weird thing about the last year, like with COVID, yeah. like, <laughs> I feel like you're my friends, but I, you know, we'll, we'll meet when we can, you know, and, yeah. Um, but it's the, the the way the whiskey community has kind of risen up around Jim, and I have to admit I've kind of drafted behind Jim, which is a pretty good person to draft behind. Oh, hell yeah. I, feel like, yeah! I feel like I'm the guy in the Rolling Stones who became the bass player after Bill Wyman <laughs> retired. I was like, yeah, I'm in the Rolling Stones. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, but you know, it's it's it was so cool. We went to Germany and we did this big event with Jim. Literally the last thing I did before the pandemic, we, we went and we did this big event and 200 people lined up to get Jim's autograph. Mm -hmm. And I have a bottle of whiskey that's in the other room here. I, I won't bore you by taking the time to go and get it. But Jim autographed it for me. I didn't ask him to autograph it for me because I actually tried to stay invisible while we were shooting the film. It yeah. just happened to be near him. And he just gets into this kind of like Terminator autograph zone where he's just signing everything <laughs> and my bottle of whiskey was near him it's actually a brooklyn resurrection dram which i'm super proud that oh my god that's which awesome which is the first that's the very first whiskey they made after yeah. they re re resurrected the distillery and you know um one of the other things that's really cool i saw earlier someone in the, the chat asked us about the black art and we didn't talk about mm -hmm. that at all but the cool thing is people always ask jim and to a lesser degree they ask me now do you know anything about the black art Jim, I'll, I'll tell you, this is, I swear the God's honest truth. I'll swear it on the souls of my children. <laughs> Jim told me no one has ever guessed the recipe for black art. And if they did, I would just lie to them and tell them they were wrong. Right. <laughs> Which is awesome. And the yeah. idea behind the black art, because we didn't mention it at all, is that P Brooklady is incredibly transparent about the whiskey they make. So they decided to make one whiskey where there was no transparency at all. It's yeah. incredibly opaque. This is you don't get to know anything about this. We release it once a year and it's just this bananas whiskey that mm -hmm. you, Jason showed you guys the entire kind of flavor map of the classic Laddie. Well, if that's the flagship, imagine what this yeah. is like. 
It's and no one gets to know it. You just trust yeah, him yeah, and yeah. you trust Adam. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, I'm picking up a wine cask. I might be picking up this. Yeah, that's so, nobody yeah, ever so, truly yeah. knows. Yeah, so, so the Bricolati Black Art is a special release, released once a year. And as Greg alluded to, you don't get to know what's in that blend. Um, <laughs> the only thing you, you know is what the proof is. That's it. Yep, that's uh, true. Right. And you, the age. You get, you, get you get to know the proof and the age, but as far as what blends and what's in it, that's yeah. the one release a year that they don't tell you shit. Nope. And you're just, you're really, and there's a poignant part in the film as well as where Adam talks about how his black art will be mm -hmm. different from Jim's mm -hmm. because, you know, their, their thumbprints and what they, you know, they got to make it their own. That's what makes it special. Yeah. Uh, black art is one of the few bottles that I just have never gotten a chance. To, it's never available here in Ohio, unfortunately. So I have to, I have to try harder to get myself a black card because I've had uh, some samples of it and it's freaking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, can, can I, can I say, I saw someone ask a question or mention something about the PC 12. Can I say something about that? That's kind of a funny story. Yeah, yeah go for it. Uh, so in the film, you'll see, we go to Australia with Jim. Yeah, I wrote to Jim and I said, we want to do one more interview with you. And he said, you can, but you have to go to Australia. I'm here for the next six weeks. So I said, <laughs> well, I'm in LA. So I'm halfway. Scotland's the same distance for me as Australia. Is, so let's just okay. go there. So, so our, Alphonse and I went to Australia. We interviewed Jim. We spend eight days there. We do this whole thing. We're leaving. And he and I get to Brisbane airport hours early. And we go to the duty free because that's what whiskey nerds do. Yep. And the guy in the duty free says to us, you guys want to try some whiskey? And we said, sure. And so we're, we're, he's given us drams and he, and he pulls out this PC-12 and he says, the guy who made this whiskey came through here just a couple hours ago. <laughs> and and he said his picture's on the bottle and, and there's and it's not on the bottle, it's in the tin. And he shows us the tin and neither one of us says, oh yeah, that's actually why we're in Australia right now. Right, sure. And he says, I only have two bottles of this left. And then, so he gives us each a drink. He has one open and then oh two God, sealed bottles. Epic. So he gives us each a dram of it. And then we each, we Alphonse and I each buy the two remaining bottles. Okay. And at first we're both like, as we're getting on the plane, we're like, yeah, we didn't tell him. We got these, the last two bottles of PC-12 in Australia. And then we got on the plane and we're like, wait a minute. Did we just play ourselves? This guy sold us. And we went and we bought these last two. We, you know, I don't know. Wendy, we got caught up in the story ourselves because these yeah. are like the last two. But uh, I, the Gallic, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because it's it's brutal. But it, I see it in the chat. The the yeah. old, uh, for hail, but it means yeah. it, the, it, this sums up our film perfectly. It's why I wanted to bring it up. That translates to the dutiful student, and that's the only Brook Lottie ever released that has Jim's signature on it and Adam's yeah. signature on it because that was the this, that was the Port Charlotte that was the handoff from Jim to Adam. Yeah. And oh, that's uh, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I wow. still have. There's a little bit left of it. There's opinion. a lot of Gaelic I still don't know, like the Highland Toast. I couldn't. I saw people were asking about the translation of Highland Toast, and I I couldn't do that. Right? And actually, that actually brings to a great comment from Everwin. Uh, the biggest thing I got from the wonderful movie is that how the art is passed down in newer generations, not yeah. what in life in many uh, in many areas today. So I think that's that's kind of a testament to what you just talked about in that bottle. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's and really cool. So I saw someone ask that too about the translation of Jim's Highland Toast. It's kind of a Simon Says thing. It means. Yeah. It translates to out with, out with, in with, in with, up with, up with, down with, like down, down with, with, your health, your health, yeah, your health. health. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I got to remember that. That might take me a while to remember, but I'll try to. It's There's a, there's a, there's a cartoon. <laughs> like you just try to do this. They'll know what you're doing. Yeah, Erica, can you send me like the diagram of how to do that? <laughs> Did it water oh. life? Didn't you post a cartoon of oh, it, Greg? Oh, my God. The guys, the guys at Aquavita. It's Jason, like Lego Man. Yeah, the, Jason, the guys at Aquavite, one of the guys, Gregor McWee, oh, made so a Lego instruction manual of a Lego guy doing Jim McEwen's Highland Toast. Hilarious. <laughs> it's the it's coolest like an thing arrow. Ever. It's an arrow going like this way, and it's like, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Actually, spe uh, speaking of Lego, my, my buddy Scotch Down Under, Ken, he's actually in uh, Australia. If you guys haven't watched him yet, um, the dude drinks whiskey for like eight hours straight, and he builds Legos. <laughs> oh my god it's an amazing amazing. Yeah, it's amazing yeah i'm gonna i have a i have an, a lego batmobile on the way here and i'm gonna attempt to do that with him there we go once he gets here there we go. <laughs> but i'm very scared i'm a rookie compared to him that's hilarious <laughs>
Yes, so Joseph. Uh, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. That's how you yeah. got the 99 lives in Contra. BA, 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 BA. And then hold down and then shut the thing off. And then when you turn it back on, you have 100 lives. <laughs> yeah, it's a cheat code. It's just all yeah, a big cheat totally. code. Totally. And, and we all used to get the books on cheats and we were like, wait, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, all right. So real quick guys, before we sign off here, uh, I have put the, the, um, the link back. Do you want to drop the, um, reserve bar code too? Do you have that in front of you? If you don't, uh, if you don't then it's on the event bright page guys. It, you can get 10% off. We're, we're giving you guys exclusively 10% off for anything that you order on reserve bar. If you don't have any Brooklady nearby, or you just don't want to leave your house, that's totally fine too. And, um, yeah, so uh, reservebar.com is uh, give gave uh, has given us a great discount for you guys. So if you guys want to try a Brooklady, if if, it's, if none of it's near you, you can uh, click that link. You get a nice discount yeah. uh, using the code that you'll see on the Eventbrite page uh, once you click it. But yeah. um, guys, definitely buy a ticket, watch the film. I shit you not, it will be one of those films that will stay with you a little bit. It's, you're gonna have to watch it a few times because there's a lot of stuff you may miss. Yeah. Um, and you'll have time to do it. We do. We we are opening it up for you know days and stuff like that. It's not like you just get yeah. to watch it once and you won't be able to re um, rewatch or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, so Erica, why don't you tell everybody where they could find you? And is there anything new from Brook Lottie we can look out for real soon? Sure. So if you're on IG, I am Erica underscore whiskey. I believe Jason tagged me earlier. You can just follow me on there. I'm typically posting pictures of cocktails and information on Brook Lottie and all that there is. So mm -hmm. that's always a good thing. Um, Brook Lottie, we just kind of mentioned it, but the Face Festival was just about two weeks ago. We just came out with a couple of new releases. But I think those are all sold and gone, but we are, um, the Optimores and the Black Art um, come out always around October 1st every year. Um, and certainly be on the lookout for new expressions that may aren't may not be part of the fold just yet. Um, kind of, you know, when we're talking about bare barley and stuff, there's definitely more of that kind of stuff coming down the fold. So Awesome. And, uh, and uh, Greg, I just want to thank you for coming on and talking about the film. It's um, it's an amazing film. It's Thank one you. that, like I said, I watched twice because it really hit me in that aspect of all different ways that I enjoy whiskey, the people behind it, the history, the future of it. And uh, I think you, like you said earlier, um, you wanted to make a, a film that <laughs> you wanted for people to, it want, you wanted it to feel like whiskey and it really did. So I think yeah. you, I think you hit a home run in that well aspect. Done, Greg. So thank you so much, Greg. Well, thank you, man, yeah. and and thank you, Erica. And you know, cheers to everyone. I, I don't know if you noticed, I just switched cameras. My camera died because we talked so long. <laughs> my, my good camera died. I switched to my crappy camera. So it cheers, was a, everyone. It was, it was the timing. That was what it was. It's like Greg, yeah. go to bed, Greg. All right. So Greg and Erica, thank you so much for coming on tonight, sharing your stories. Again, guys, go watch the film. It's absolutely amazing. And then let me yeah. know. Uh, shoot me a message, a comment for this video after you watch it. Let me know We'd how you enjoyed it. it. Uh, check out uh, Greg. What are you? Uh, we Dram Big Man. What are you on Instagram? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. We Dram Big Man is my inst my my whiskey Instagram. But the film is Water of Life Film. That's on Instagram. We have a Facebook page and a group. It's yep. all Water of Life Film. Yep. And if anyone sees the film, please write to us on any of those places or support at WaterOfLifeFilm.com. Please write to us and let us know. We would love it. I mean, we yeah. we, we have an amazing uh, community on Facebook on our Facebook group. That's awesome. Which is our team teases me that it's just me basically me being a whiskey nerd with 800 whiskey nerds. <laughs> but I mean, I'm sure Jay, that's what Jason's got too, right? We just have these little, oh, we, have, we have these, these, these great friends that are just, you know, whiskey nerds everywhere. It is. It's uh this is, if you want to nerd out, this is the stream to go to. So I really <laughs> appreciate you guys. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys really, you know, you know, uh, you know, giving, giving the nerds a big hug. I appreciate it. So uh, guys, uh, thanks, so much for, thanks so much for hanging out tonight. Thanks to Erica. Thanks to Greg. Uh, as I always say, it's not about the whiskey, it's the people you share it with. And then the, you know, in, in, when it, when it comes to scotch, what do we say? We say Slante. 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 or Slante. Yeah. Any of those. Slante. Slante. Cheers guys. <laughs> we'll see you next week on the master and Jerome. It's going to be, we're going to have, um, uh, David Jennings on from rare bird One Hundred and One. We're talking Russell reserve 13. And because you might not be able to find one, we're going to try to blend our own.
Russell Reserve 13. So there we go. stay tuned for that next week. See you guys next time on the Master Drum. Take care. Bye, you guys. Thank uh, you. Uh, Greg, Greg and Erica, stick around, okay? Don't, do. don't sign off this yet. Cheers.